Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Talking to Thinkers. In this second part of our discussion with Professor James Conant, we shall talk about three key topics. In the first part, we shall talk about how he approaches philosophers, both past and present. We shall then move on to the second key area, which will focus upon philosophers who would have a major influence on Professor Conant, or who he has found very, very interesting. These include Immanuel Kant, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Barry Stroud, and Richard Rorty. The third and final part of our conversation will be taken up with a discussion of Professor Conant's own philosophical journey, and then she'll look at briefly where he thinks his future interests will take him. I hope you enjoy this conversation. One of the things that I think has really impressed me about your work is that you tend to leave your ego at the door, okay? And what I mean by that is when um, you, you tend not to impose your own philosophical views on your interpretation of other philosophers, let me put it that way, or and it's not even clear what your philosophical views are, that you have any when you're sometimes discussing. Now, if I give an example, it would be your introductions to the two books you edited of, of Putman's, you know, Realism of the Human Face and Words and Things, okay? It's not that you're giving a summary. Have you got me a neutral summary of Putnam's thought? But it's, so it, it's clearly an interpretation, but it's not one where I feel that your ideas are invading it in some sort of assertive way. Now, you don't do that all the time. And we'll come to a thinker where you're a little bit more uh, assertive in your view of where that thinker is significant or troublesome. But anyway, what my question really is, do you think that the ego can be um, an obstacle for philosophical understanding? Well, I think you have several questions there. I do. Yeah. That, that are all really good questions. <laughs> um, but but let me, um, just to help myself think about what I want to say, tease them apart. So um, so it seems like one question here, which um, would be worth saying some things about is, you know, what is it to write about another philosopher? And is, is there one way to do that? Or are there different ways to do that? And what is what do I think it is to do that well? Um, and then there's another question, which is, um, whether one can and should, and whether I do park my ego at the door. <coughs> and I think those two sets of questions are related, but so, um, <coughs> and what I'd like to say about the second, I'd like to say after I answer the first, so, and so it shows they're related, um, but, but it might be worth just pulling them apart a little bit to start with. Um, now, um, I mean, one thing is, I think there is a tendency to assume a lot of people assume this, there is one right way to write about another philosopher. Um, it could be a contemporary or it could be a figure in the past. Um, and, and, and then sometimes people will draw a distinction and then they'll say there's history of philosophy. And then there's the right way to do that. And then there's writing about relatively contemporary figures. And then you're doing something completely different. But there's one way, right, of doing that. So they'll kind of notice there's two ways, but then maybe at least two ways, but then they'll distribute them over, you know, two different kinds of, you know, object of interpretation, the really dead one and, and the, the living or recently living one. Um, so the first thing I think is that there is not one way of doing this well. Um, for either the dead or the living. Um, in any way one can do it for either, one can do for both actually, I think. Um, which is not to say, you know, just there are thousands of ways of doing it and do whatever you want and, and, and let, it, you, know, you know, let a million flowers bloom. It, but, but there are different ways that are worth distinguishing. And then in my work, I have tried to alternate between doing each of these things because I think there's value to being clear about which one is doing and doing that one well. Um, um, because if one's, I think, unclear about what one's doing, that itself affects the clarity of what comes out of what one's doing. <laughs> so I think one way at one extreme of writing about another philosopher 
you know, I think is the model that certain historians have. But you could do this for you know, a relatively contemporary figure too, which is as it were, to just learn their vocabulary. You know, in some cases that might involve learning their jargon and then just trying to say things they would say and they would ascribe to themselves. This has certain limits, you know, if you're thinking about any interesting complicated philosophy, there's certain issues that are not exactly clear what they should think about. And there are certain tensions. It's gonna be very hard to stay completely within these ground rules, I think. But but as a you know, as it were regulative ideal, you know, we, we could we could call this sort of the doxographical ideal. You know, I want to only, as it were, attribute to that author beliefs that they held and attribute to them in forms of expression that they themselves would understand so they would be able to self-ascribe those beliefs as so expressed. That's like one extreme. You can do that. I, I'm not saying it has no value. Um, um, I, I do think if that was the only way philosophers knew how to write about philosophers, it would be the death of philosophy. I do think it's, you know, as it were, controlled by um, an ideal that, that sort of purges philosophy of some of its philosophical energy. But nonetheless, I think there's something to the discipline, you know. It's worth noticing when I explain Putnam's ideas this way. Putnam himself wouldn't put it that way. But I think this brings, so I think it's, it's still good to be able to keep the book straight <laughs> and know what you're doing and how it stands in that way of doing things. So I think this ideal and understanding what it involves is important and to see it's an option. The other extreme, which you find practiced by a lot of analytic philosophers, is as it were, to read the philosopher and just sort of think about what do I find interesting here? You know, which you know, of the things he says strikes me as true? Um, and, you know, and therefore, you know, one of the things you're assuming is, you know, which of the things he's saying even strike me as intelligible, <laughs> um, and, um, but not just intelligible, but also true or interesting, and then going forward with it. Or here's some things he says that strike me as clearly false, and then trying to demolish it. That's another extreme in which, you know, um, we don't just treat these people as having their own internally hermetically sealed set of beliefs, um, which require their concepts, their language, literacy in their tradition or their moment in the past, and we can report them. But um, we're, we're, as it were, trying to check every thought and every form of expression that, uh, that's our own at the door. But we're going to the other extreme. And we're only talking about them, you know, in a language that requires no language learning for our listener to understand because it's the philosophical idiom of 21st century Timothy Williamson, Oxford. And this is what we all speak. And now I'm explaining Spinoza to you in this idiom. And if I say what his views on knowledge are, justification is, or whatever else, you know, you can understand the words knowledge and justification, any other term of philosophical art. I mean, just the way we've always understood it. <laughs> and, 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 um, um, and that is the virtue of making Spinoza completely our contemporary. He's completely involved in a conversation with us. We can say what we think is right and wrong with him. Um, but there is no familiarization. And we're just kind of, as it were, screening out absolutely anything that's alien in his thought. Um, now, I think that, you know, doesn't kill philosophy the way the first thing does, but it does deprive philosophy of a tremendous resource for philosophical progress. And it deprives us particularly, I think, of much of the value of studying the history of philosophy and also philosophy that comes from a different philosophical tradition than our own, even if it's fairly contemporaneous, you know kind of misses why Gilbert Ryle was interested in studying Husserl or Heidegger or so forth. <laughs> you know, take an example. Um, so, uh, <coughs> so, so, I mean, I, you know, so there, there's a lot of room for ways of reading philosophy that's somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, you know, or, 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 or different positions along that spectrum. And, and what it is to be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum is to want to preserve something of the first ideal, that is some fidelity to what the philosophers said. We're not just interested in what they should have said, so that you know 
This is what Khan should have said. This is what he should have said. So Khan himself, in a way, drops out. <laughs> we just have these sentences. We don't need to think about whether he would have gone with us. Um, so he wants some sort of conception of fidelity to that way of thought, which is different than ours. So that we need to keep two sets of books. What did they think? What do I think? Um, we want to keep some, you know, as I'm putting it, ideal of fidelity. But we also want some ideal of, if not contemporaneity, they're just speaking our language, some way in which they still have philosophical bearing on the present and our understanding of what we've come to understand in the philosophical present can inform and enrich, you know, our sense of what the strengths and limitations of the past are. So that, you know, there's, there's, there is, you know, if not con contemporaneity, at least a kind of mutual philosophical bearing of you know the thought that is ours and the thought that isn't ours so you want an ideal you want an ideal of fidelity but you want an ideal of as it were philosophical pertinence as well and and then those are what are balanced you know as you move in the middle parts of that spectrum and they're balanced out in different ways and i don't think there's one way to do this um but i have developed something which you know as you know, through various um, accidents of people calling me names and, um, and and my friends' names and my taking some of them on, and, <laughs> um, I've come to think of as what I call a resolute reading of a, a text. And, um, and my conception of what a resolute reading is involves one particular conception. I don't say it's the only one or everyone should read things this way, um, but a particular conception of what it is to work with historical texts or texts from different tradition that um, that I think of as having the potential to yield fruitful forms of philosophical insight. And um, so what, on the one hand, a resolute reading does try to understand the philosopher with respect to at least his own fundamental ambitions. So we do need to understand what we need if we want to give a resolute reading of Descartes on some issue or Kant on some issue or early Wittgenstein is the author of the Tractatus on some issue. What were they trying to do in philosophy? What was their fundamental ambition? What would have counted for them as success? Why does their text take the shape or assume the form that does and how is that related to the conception of what philosophy is? We need to at least be clear about those things. We can't just bring all of our conceptions about that to the text. Um, so, so we have that much of an ideal of fidelity we're working with. But then, um, you know, employing as much clarity and rigor we can and some of the resources for, as it were, having a fully, you know, penetrating conception of what such clarity and rigor require involves then sort of thinking through in the light of that philosopher's understanding what it would be for them to fully vindicate their philosophical aspirations, um, um, where that philosophy leads. And so where the tensions are in that thought and what would resolve them, which then, you know, also involves sort of the possibility articulation of something that's genuinely Kantian or Cartesian or Tractarian or something else, an inspiration, which isn't just identical to what that philosopher thought. You're not just simply trying to say, to you know, fully remain faithful as conception, you must now think this. And, and, and you're claiming if you ask Kant, he would say yes. Um, it, is, it should be such that if you ask Kant and you got him to see the problem, he'd say, oh, I see there's a problem. <laughs> you know? I mean, if you're doing this well, it's um, it should at least, you know, if you can imagine this conversation, you know, across time, it should at least look like that. Um, but um, so that there's a way of sort of harnessing potential in past philosophical thought and, and helping to move it towards later philosophical conversation, working within a certain canon of what fidelity to that conception of philosophy requires. It also involves thinking it through and thinking it beyond its historical moment. So um, that's something I've argued can be done and can be done well. And it involves neither a conception of um, fidelity that's identical with the doxographical kind of antiquarian historian of ideas conception of what it is to do history well, though it still involves, I think, a genuine conception of fidelity to that philosopher and a, an ability to keep track of the present and that person. Um, and it involves a conception of 
having one's reading everywhere controlled, but an eye to the present in a sense of why does this matter to what we think now? Which isn't, as it were, um, eviscerating the interest of the idiosyncratic, idiosyncras, syncras, idiosyncrasy and, um, and um, individuality and also alienness of the past philosopher by just insisting that, you know, we don't need to learn anything new. We don't need to learn any concepts. Any concept he has, we can translate into one of ours. You know, any assumption we take to be self-evident, they'll take to be self-evident. So it involves the possibility of developing that philosopher's thought in such a way that um, um, in bringing out what's alien, but nonetheless philosophically compelling in a past dispensation of thought, we can start to see how the concepts we employ, say for knowledge, belief, justification, are optional. We could have carved these things slightly differently. And now we have to start to vindicate our entitlement to speaking this way. And we can start to bring out certain assumptions we've never noticed that we always use. That doesn't necessarily mean those assumptions are bad, but now once we see the assumptions as assumptions and don't take them for granted, we have to vindicate them in a different way. And I think often the attempt to do that will then involve philosophical movement and take us out of a certain kind of stasis and dogmatism that tends to, um, in certain ways, start to set in in each philosophical generation. And, and it makes the philosophically alien then an extremely powerful resource for sort of challenging the philosophically present. And so it keeps something of that second ideal, namely that we remain in conversation with the great philosophers of the past or with philosophers in very different places. And we see philosophy as having sufficient unity that any part of philosophy can bear in any other. And that, that's something I care about a lot. So, um, so this conception of resolute reading I've developed over the years is one way of occupying a certain kind of position, which does conceive itself as very much in the middle of those two extremes in the spectrum. But I don't think it's the only way to be in the middle. It's one way of, as it were, specifying what the ideal of fidelity can come to that doesn't sacrifice, you know, um, the possibility of a conversation across the gulf. And it also involves a conception of philosophical um, bearing of the past or the other and the present and vice versa that doesn't lead to this kind of, as it were, mere antiquarian museum pieces, each of which we admire, but none of them speak to each other or to us. Um, and... Um, but I do very much think it's just one case. I don't think it's everyone should do philosophy this way. But I do think the ways in which it's different, people have found very threatening. And so there's been a lot of polemics, even just locally in things like Tractatus literature or Kant literature, or something, where people were sort of saying, this is, from a scholarly point of view, incompetent. Or, or the contemporary analytic philosopher will have a different objection by saying, well, everybody knows the Tractatus is, you know, one of the founding works of analytic philosophy, which is, you know, a treatise that, you know, assumes logical atomism. And so it must be fine. You know, and so there's attacks from different directions, one in which, you know, a certain Whiggish history is being assaulted, and another in which there's a certain conception of scholarly competence that won't allow for, as it were, the freedom to, as it were, make philosophy out of the work rather than just, as it were, freeze it in time. Um, um, but um, that's okay. <laughs> I take all of that. It's an encouragement from all of that hostility. Um, but I do think there are many different ideals. And, you know, I think, you know, you mentioned Quentin Skinner in an earlier conversation. You know, I think Quentin Skinner's, you know, conception of what it is to, um, you know, read a past histor historical figure in philosophy well is very different from Bernard Williams's. You know, which is very different from Martin Heidegger's. And um, I, 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 I'm inclined to think that each of them, you know, bring out something <laughs> in each of those figures that it's worth learning from, you know. Well, that's what strikes me, because when I read your, there's a sort of a lack of doctrinaire kind of, there's a lack of doctrinaire uh, strain in your life. I yeah. mean, for example, if I, you know, when you look at, uh, 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 a worry that I have sometimes when I look at past philosophers, long dead philosophers, is that maybe the antiquarians are right, that there or Skinner, for example, is right. There's the meaning that is the meaning at the time, and that's all it is. And <coughs> yes. We need to stop kidding ourselves. There's some sort of trans historical meaning going on. And then you have the other extreme, as you mentioned there, the kind of the contemporary, you know, the guys that sort of are, are sort of unashamed anachronists, right? They just sort of look at 
Well, Plato got this wrong. He wasn't a Wittgenstein. There's a little bit of him that survives, but it's mainly wrong. Okay. And he's wrong because he wasn't Wittgenstein enough. And it's just, you know, so the, the history becomes the handmaiden of the present. And the worry I have is that, that okay, so if the, se- if the second people are right, there's no point in doing history anymore. Why, you just do your own thinking for yourselves because history becomes meaningless. It loses its ability to defamiliarize ourselves, okay? The worry I have is that there isn't anything else in the middle. You've just- well, well, I, th- I think both sides encourage this. In yes. that way, I think there's certain assumptions on both sides I want to resist. I mean, if you look at, you know, if you talk with Quinn and you let him explain to you what it is for there to be trans-historical meaning, and it involves, you know, some fairly, you know, it really involves some, you know, weighty metaphysical assumptions. And I think it's true that some analytic philosophers are working on those assumptions. Then I'm inclined to agree that, um, yes, there is enough of this, you know, that. Um, but then we recoil from the failure of that picture of what it is for meaning to just float above history. Um, you know, for there not to be such a thing, which is just language that can go back and forth. And we don't have to, you know, you know, the topic about language is not relevant here because I think there's a version of it that holds for philosopher's language. You know, I have to learn Kant's language. <laughs> you know, um, but, 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 but I think the other extreme is also false. It involves another fantasy of language as if, it's these hermetically sealed things that don't change and don't grow as if it's a little system. Whereas, I mean, I think all mutual human understanding involves language learning. And when I learn physics, I'm learning as a student, I'm learning a new language. And when I learn to appreciate E.E. E. Cummings poetry, I'm learning to do something very different with language, which is also new. And then when I start to learn a modern contemporary language, especially one like Japanese, I'm also learning language. And so, yes, when I learn Aristotle, if I want to know what natural versus violent motion is, or I'm, 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 you know, I'm learning Kant and I want to know what akentness means. Well, it's translated as knowledge, but, you know, it's, it's an amosation of a verb. Um, it has a plural, there are akentness, there are no knowledges, you know, there are false akentness, for Kant, there are no false knowledges in English, <laughs> and so um, and so then we start realizing this word just has a different grammar, you know. And then you start realizing that you know the fundamental meaning of a Kentness is for a certain kind of capacity, which is exercised, and then it can be exercised successfully or unsuccessfully. And so the idea of a false act of a Kentness, you know, a failed act of the capacity, isn't a contradiction in term. And there can be a succession of such acts, and so they can pluralize. In the way knowledge, which is just a mass noun count, that's a count noun. Um, and so we realize we can't just translate this word, you know, we need to learn it. And then that's not just a bit of funny language learning, it gives you a different philosophical picture about what knowledge is. And you start with a general capacity, whereas contemporary analytic philosophy starts with S knows that P, and it's an individual, and then how do I get from me to you? <laughs> you have, in the one case, you're starting with the general and what its determinations are. In the other case, you're starting with the particulars, and you're trying to work out to, like, you know, agreement. <laughs> um, and you're starting with knowledge, and then belief is a primitive form of the exercise of that capacity. Analytic philosophy, we start with belief, and then we add things like justification and truth to it to get knowledge. And you start realizing there's a very different conception of how to think about the whole issue here. That is the background of why the vocabulary works possibly properly. So to understand why the vocabulary works differently, we can't just translate his words into our words um, and think we've understood them, involves, requires learning all of that philosophy. <laughs> um, and uh, But that doesn't mean we can't learn it. And we just have to treat Kant as this, um, you know, thing that's sealed into the 18th century that doesn't speak to us because we don't live in the 18th century. I don't think that's true. I mean, because I think, I think, you know, learning always also involves language learning and the development of every language involves accretions to the language that involve novelties that change the language from within. And I think the growth of philosophy has always been like that as well. I mean, so, um, so I don't think we're forced between the there's just these transcendent structures whose specific determinations in, you know, particular thinkers or moments of time or history or community or culture are relevant to achieving understanding, or everything is hermetically sealed 
in these different chambers that we just have to keep straight. And we can talk about this one and that one, but they don't speak to each other. And on the contrary, I think putting them up against each other will cause both to change just the way in which the norm and conquest, you know, as it were, completely transform both the language the Normans spoke and the Anglo-Saxon Brits spoke, and it became a new thing. So I think, you know, such confrontations and juxtapositions are incredibly philosophically synergetic and fruitful. And, and they're not just, it's exactly the opposite, I think, of what Quentin thinks in a bit in that respect. Um, but, um, but, 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 but what strikes me there is how, as it were, um, the more historicist view and the more analytic, you know, picture of what is metaphysically and linguistically transcendent, I think involves actually a shared assumption about you know, what, the, what the options are there, which both sides would be horrified to be told that they're very much like each other <laughs> philosophically. But this is all also why I think, um, um, but you know, um, Quentin's own conception of what it is for things to be historically specific and historicist is a very modern idea. You know, um, you'd have a very hard time explaining it to Plato or Descartes. You know, so there's a moment of you know being locked into modernity there <laughs> himself, which I think he's a little bit blind to. Um, certain assumptions that go with the modern. Um, so what's when you were talking there was I'm, I'm slightly skeptical that we have, you're talking there, you, you, you know, we've got these two opposing extremes, you might call it. Let's call it historicism versus kind of timelessness, okay, or some sort of continuity. With this timeless and language is just sort of, you know, an accident of how we express the stock of thoughts that are there to think at any time and any place. Exactly. So I, I, so I think this is a false dichotomy, right? I don't. I, yeah. I, well, I'm saying more. I'm not just saying it's a false dichotomy, but I'm saying it's actually a shared assumption. Okay. So, can you explain where you see the shared assumption there, and how your resolute reading escapes that? Well, I think the sh I think I think um, in the historicist view is is sort of created through a as it were recoil from the first view. So it's a certain picture of what transcendence requires or what it is for people that speak different languages to be able to understand each other. And, and, and that's viewed as a condition of the possibility of such understanding and transcendence. And they keep the idea that the commitments of that view are a condition of um, such understanding. Okay. Or transcendence, and the condition isn't fulfilled, so there can't be any, you know, <laughs> understanding. But 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 the crucial conditional is still there. I mean, I think so. I think there is something skeptical or nihilistic about the historicist view, and I think it has the structure that skepticism often has, which is the skeptic keeps the dogmatist picture of what it would be able to vindicate him, his entitlement to something. Only if this, then can I say I have knowledge, or only if this are there genuine moral truths, or only if this, then there's free will. And the skeptic thinks, but that condition doesn't hold. So there's no free will. There is no truth. There's no, and, and so the skeptic is, is working with a dogmatist picture, but um, there's a truth in skepticism, which is that the dogmatist picture involves, you know, a flawed conception of how to, you know, hang on to the thing we want. That's the truth in the skepticism. The mistake in the skepticism is to think that um, the dogmatist is right. This is the only way. This was the only way to do this. And so we should say there is no blah, blah, where you think there is a blah, blah. There is no transcendent, you know, meaning there is no possibility of the past really, you know, philosophically engaging the present or vice versa. There is no fruitful encounter that could have the sort of synergy I'm talking about. All we do is, as it were, discover our own parochialism and historical locations during the past. And that's very helpful. And I, there's something I agree with that. I do think a confrontation with the past can bring out what's parochial about the present, but I think it can also bring out what is non obligatorily parochial about it and help us clarify, but, and also bring out what in the past and the present is common ground and what isn't in a way that, you know, requires some very careful thought to rearticulate through a set of concepts that, 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 you know, are going to have to themselves be minted because they're not, as it were, just um, 
internal to either the one way of thinking or the other, just like the language that grew out of the Norman conquest was not just, you know, Norman and it wasn't just, you know, Anglo-Saxon, you know, neither one of these things, there was a colonial subjugation, but the language itself, you know, you know, reflected something much more complicated. <laughs> so. Well, that's that, okay. I'm very clear now. I, I, you've made it very clear where they share this kind of predicament and that they have different I think the fundamental assumptions of the modern picture are kept in in the um, skeptical recoil from it. And to that extent, historicism strikes me as preserving many assumptions of, of a certain kind of moment of modernity in philosophy that I think a more fruitful encounter with non-modern ways of thinking can bring out the optionality of. Okay, very good. Can you, okay, so I'm very clear about the commonality there. Can you just spell out a, a in a little bit more detail, how your resolute reading doesn't fall victim to either the, the you know the historicist trap or the or the kind of timelessness trap, the classic analytic. You know, how does it how does it escape that that kind of bind? Well, I just want to point out that that if it escapes that kind of bind, that doesn't itself show that it's a good thing. No, no, sure, yeah. I mean, I think most people that object to it um, don't object to it on other grounds, you know, and it's just much more to talk about. But I mean, um, I mean, I do think there's something weird, a slightly weird about the historicist picture. I mean, I think, you know, to understand Aristotle or Plato or even someone who's only a couple hundred years ago like Kant or even Frege who's, or the early Wittgenstein who was at the beginning of what's supposed to be, you know, the tradition of philosophy we have in Oxford today it was, you know, more like 150 or 90 years ago. Um, um, I think already um, one has to transport oneself back into very different ways of thinking and very different assumptions and reacting against a philosophical background that you need to recover to see what they're reacting against, which is no longer available to us. And I think this is hard to do. So I think we're always understanding the past from the vantage point of the present, you know. Um, 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 I mean, you know, an interesting thing to think about here is, um, um, this is an analogy, but it connects up the earlier part of our interview about languages with, with this part about understanding past figures. I, I think, you know, the following are extraordinarily different. Learning to speak a modern language. So my going to Japan and learning to speak modern Japanese and write modern Japanese. So that is an active language in which I can express my thoughts and I can enter into a certain kind of community with the fellow speakers. So if I say something slightly funny, if I pronounce it slightly differently, if I use a form that doesn't involve just the right degree of politeness, they think I'm speaking to the second youngest daughter rather than the third youngest daughter and everything is misunderstood that this was not a nuance that I'm very in control of. And, so I, I'm very confused by why things aren't falling the way they are. Um, um, you know, I, I, I need to have a certain kind of control of those nuances just as they're understood. And I need to be able to inhabit them and I need to do them spontaneously. And I need to tap into, in a way, the capacities I tapped into as a child when I learned my first language. The way I learned my first language, the way you learn English, was not when you were three and four years old. Um, you went to English class for an hour or two hours a day, three times a week and did your homework. You learned it in a different way. You, in some ways it was more like the acquisition of a practical capacity like swimming, not by going to swimming class, but by three thrown in the water. Um, whereas when, when um, oh, I know, sweetie, this interview is going on forever. <laughs> um, um, whereas, um, you know, when, when, you know, you know, the classicist or the classically trained scholar of ancient philosophy um, learns ancient Greek or Latin. They never tap in to the set of capacities that they tapped into when they learned to speak their native language as a child. 
it's it's all in a way a complicated decoding operation. <laughs> um, their relation to it is always passive. They are never, you know, addressing speech to the Asian philosopher, you know, and making sure that they understand him. In fact, they're hardly ever speaking these languages. I mean, one interesting fact, which is connected with our previous conversation, is they're even, you know, not mastering anything but the written sign form. So if you study Latin as a child in Oxford, you will learn to pronounce Latin words, you know, within the phonological field of English. You know? And if you learn to read Latin aloud in Germany, you will learn to pronounce it in the phonological field of German. And if you learn it in, Latin, in Italian, it, it's starting to bleed a little bit more into the language of the street. And it has, sounds different. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, all of those vowels and things which things end with take on a different kind of vitality. Um, and so... Actually, you know, in a funny way, it's spoken form is the form of your native language, not that language. This is the kind of way in which it's not really an independent language. Um, um, so there's a kind of passivity in your relation to it. Um, and, and in some ways, that is our relation to the past philosophers. You know, we, we never engage directly in speech with them. We're, we, you know, our relation to them is always kind of mediated by our present way of thinking and trying to understand them, you know. Um, um, you know, there's various exceptions to the language case I mentioned, you know, there are, you know, parts of Vatican City in which, you know, priests from different parts of the world speak Latin to each other and letters of recommendation are written in Latin, you know, um, it's still, as it were, I don't know what Gante called the grammatica for certain limited um, learned communities, especially in the Catholic world. Um, you know, very interesting case is, you know, modern Greeks who are scholars of ancient Greek ancient Greek philosophy say, when they read a passage from Plato, you know, say they're giving a lecture in English, but they read out a quotation from Plato in the Greek, you suddenly hear that they are reading a passage from a language in which they can also like, you know, order dinner. <laughs> you know, it, it, it sounds really different than, than, you know, even our greatest, you know, scholars of ancient philosophy, like Michael Freda or Miles Burnett, when they read that passage, where, you know, it doesn't have that linguistic vitality. <laughs> and it, it's a slightly alien object, which is being framed and displayed. It's, it's you know, there. So, um, so, so there, there's some slight exceptions to what I'm saying. And, and there's, you know, we'd, we'd have to draw many distinctions to get these distinctions clear. But there is a kind of way in which I think our approach, the way in which we habit the thought of a a past philosopher is more like our relation to an ancient language where, you know, ancient Greek, we don't know how it was pronounced, you know. There's all things we don't know about nuances of meaning, you know. You know, that no matter how great the scholar, modern scholar, in, you know, ancient Greek is, if he were teleported back somehow, prayer impossibly, to the form of 5th century BC Athens and tried to talk to anybody, nobody would understand that. <laughs> and, and he would not understand a lot. <laughs> that, that, that I think is something that's forgotten in the knowledge we have. So it, it is mediated, you know, by this, by all kinds of intermediary understandings of it over different ages. Um, so and, and so, so, so they, that's one thing that's left out of the historicism, I think, is that this is itself mediated knowledge. Yeah. Um, and um, and um, there isn't anything which is achieving full con contemporaneity. Um, um, and, um, and, 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 and that's our relation to the past. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think philosophy, like so many other forms of humanistic learning and even a certain amount of science and so forth, is essentially tradition bound. So it's our understanding of the tradition and what we've inherited from it, which allows us to understand the present. The present isn't this sort of, this sort of time slice that floats by itself in no relation the past and no understanding of the past. So, so I think it's essentially media. And I think one of the things the resolute reading does is it just go back to your question now is it turns up the intensity on that mm. and it accepts that. And it tries to, you know, articulate in a way that has a certain independence. What are, you know, the aspirations of the past, you know, way of thinking or the West past conception of philosophy is lots ideal. And it focuses in on things that we find most unintelligible. So one of the things a resolute reading will want to do, I think, is focus on the things that seem most puzzling to us and not sort of um, push them out because this is just too puzzling. Let's not worry about that. Um, uh, 
you know, so, you know, Aristotle will say there's no vacuum. That's really weird. But no, what is it about his whole way of thinking that requires him to say that idea makes no sense? Um, you know, um, Descartes will say we must not deny that God could have made contradictories true or, you know, two and two not equal four. And people are like, well, what is he saying? Let's, <laughs> let's just be polite and overlook that crazy remark and go on and read the sensible stuff. Whereas um, I think, you know, one thing a resolute reading will do is it'll zero in on what most puzzles us about the text. Um, something that just looks like it's a contradiction or, you know, the way people understood the end of the Tractatus to take a famous example, just a, a moment of self-made, which um, uh, just seems unfortunate, <laughs> but that will, we'll kind of bracket that and read the rest. Um, um, and, um, and try to organize the reading around taking those moments seriously as a way of seeing why this is a way of thinking that's very different than ours. So it will have that difference, but it will still be controlled by our sense of what we can make sense of. And what we can make sense of always does involve um, the first person present singular, the first person present indicative plural. You know, it's, so we have to make sense of it now, what they meant in the past. We're not leaving out that moment and pretending that's gone. We're just understanding what they meant rather than anything we mean. Any, any, in our resolute reading, any understanding of what we have of what he or she meant then is what we are able to understand of it. And we don't deny that moment. Um, and, and so I think that's the way in which, um, um, you know, it's both um, going to avoid the historicism because it's rooted through what ultimately can speak to us philosophically. Okay, that's good. That's but at the same time, it 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 it, it doesn't um, go with what I was calling just the anachronistic, yeah. scrupulous opportunism of the present. Because the point is not to just, as it were, fit them into our present conception. The point is to articulate a way of understanding against which we can compare our present conception and see how it measures up. Okay, very good. That's I'm very clear about that now. Um, can we move on to another topic? Um, can, can I just say one? Can I just go back to one thing that got kind of lost, which yeah. is um, well, there's two things that got a bit lost. One was you were saying I, I wanted to come around to the question as you first asked it and said, you know, in my own writing about other philosophers, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think I have a um, a single mode. I, I mean, I haven't wanted to have one. I haven't had one. So some of the things. Um, those introductions to Putnam, yeah. um, I think I can say what I was trying to do there. And I wasn't just trying to sort of say something true about Hillary Putnam over the last 15 years or 20 years of his life when he wrote those papers. Uh, even though I collected papers from, you know, a, a wide span. I, I was trying to do something a little different than that. I was doing my best. And, and, and Putnam's a very interesting philosopher in this regard, which is part of why I found writing those introductions interesting, because he was an unbelievably protean philosopher who changed his mind in a lot. Um, so he, you know, it's sort of like the kind of change you get over historical time in the history of philosophy, you get over biographical time in the life of someone like Hillary Putnam or a Bertrand Russell, he just changed his mind so dramatically in very fundamental ways. Um, and so, um, I was trying to bring to expression in those introductions where I thought Putnam was then, where all of this was leading to and the corner he was, you know, turning then. It wasn't that I was saying, and this is where he's going to go because he's Hillary Putnam. So I also felt um, with some humility that I could sort of see where this curve was bending, but I didn't know, you know, once we got around that turn where it would bend next. <laughs> um, but um because he is someone who tends to also react against himself, you know. Um, but I was trying to sort of bring to expression sort of who his heroes are, who he was reading, how he's thinking about history of philosophy now, why Kant was important to him in a new way that he wasn't, how he'd rediscovered Wittgenstein, he was different for him. Certain minor figures like Cavell and Diamond and people like that, not minor in the sense that they weren't important contemporaries, but I mean, they weren't Wittgenstein or Kant, um, but were quoted a lot in the essays in these collections, why they were quoted and you know, what kind of touchstones or exemplars Iris Murdoch, these people were for him at that moment in the late 80s, early 90s. So I was trying to, as it were, so I wasn't trying to do something about, you know, all of the essays. I was trying to do something about 
the author of the essays and where writing these essays collectively had brought him and how that bore on certain disputes he was having with some of his contemporaries, like his former students at MIT or like Richard Wardy, people like that, where he'd actually moved up a little further from them than he had just a few years ago. And I was, so I was trying to sort of advance that conversation on Putnam's behalf, on my understanding of who he was. So in a way I was checking my ego at the door. You know, I wrote some things that I didn't completely agree with. You know, I mean, I, you know, see Wittgenstein and Kant and Dewey is quite different from each other. And I wouldn't have grouped them together in the way Putnam's does. But, you know, I was trying to sort of put the Putnam's pantheon of heroes together in a way that was my understanding of what Putnam thought. So in that sense, I was checking my ego in the door. But on the other hand, I was sort of trying to like articulate where I think this was going and, and in a way that also was, you know, moving Putnam. And, and bringing out, um, you know, where his thought was going, which wasn't just reportage, <laughs> but was trying to fill, think philosophically through what his commitment seemed to be. Um, um, so, um, so it had a moment of, you know, a resolute reading of Putnam, we might say, but, <clears throat> but I was subordinating myself to Putnam. Now I've written other things about Putnam, um, which are more critical and where, where, you know, I've said, you know, I think here he's confusing. Sir. And so another figure that came up in those introductions a fair amount was McDowell. And the way McDowell came up in those introductions was this is who McDowell is for Putnam. And this is how he sees things. In another essay I wrote, you know, kind of adjudicating a debate between McDowell and Putnam, I tried to articulate um, where I thought Putnam was misunderstanding McDowell, where they were talking by each other, articulate something that involves some concepts of my own that didn't belong to Putnam or McDowell to adjudicate that debate. I sort of thought that's not what I want to do for writing those introductions. It's kind of not my place as writing an introduction to his volumes to sort of make it about me um, in that way. But it's not because I can't or I don't want to in writing another thing about Putnam. I did. And I've written different things about some of my contemporaries, including McDowell, that have been a little bit more like the first thing you know, on Putnam's behalf where I'm trying to bring out the power of what they're doing. And another thing where um, I'm keeping track of my philosophical voice and theirs, and I'm more critical. Um, and, um, and similarly, you know, for writing about past philosophers, you know, one thing I wanted to do is sort of inhabit their thought and bring out how it's a different shape for certain people and to bring out its power. Um, but in other things I've written that I've wanted to say, but, you know, you know, measured from the perspective of Wittgenstein, this is what seems to me limited or distorting or philosophically unfruitful in the way Kant thinks about this issue. Where in this other essay, I just tried to bring out the power of the way Kant thought about it in a way I thought hadn't been appreciated. So um, I, I um, wouldn't want to write about other philosophers in only one of these ways and not the other. But I think there's a value to doing, to writing about other philosophers in different ways. But what I have tried to do in each thing I've written about another philosopher is be clear <laughs> about what I'm doing and what my goal is there. And sort of say at the beginning, the aim here is to bring out the possibility of this reading of, you know, philosopher X. The aim in this essay is to bring out, you know, the limitation of this philosopher's thought, a certain tension from this point of view. And, and so that means also what it would mean to check my ego at the door is going to mean different things. I mean, in the first task, I really am in a certain way checking my ego at the door. In the second kind of essay, I'm not completely checking my ego at the door because I am, you know, interested in what I think about it. I am still doing it enough to be able to keep track of the difference between that philosopher, why they're great, why they're interesting, while not being me. <laughs> so, so there's some as it were ability to see past my own ego. But I'm also saying, you know, what I think is limited or wrong or fruitless or what it would be to go beyond this. So there is a there is a first person singular who doesn't just speak as the representative of the other philosopher, but speaks as the philosopher James Conan. This is what he thinks. So my, my ego is not absent, you know, in that way from the second form of writing. So I think how my ego is present and what it is in each of these kinds of writings to not let your ego play the wrong role, I think is different for each case. That's what I wanted to say about that. Okay, that's interesting because uh, and what I thought was very, what worked really well, um, especially in the first type, uh, your introductions to those two collections of essays by Putnam was that you made you make the reader think not just differently about Putnam, but also about Kant, also about Cavell, um, also about Wittgenstein. Yes, uh, that's what I found. It, it's a very fertile way of actually a way into Kant. Uh, 
yes, yes. And in that other, in that in that sense, it's a different way of doing the history of philosophy, actually. Yes. Uh, because you you don't just go to you know Kant one hundred and one. Yes. Let's look at Kant uh, through Ro through Putnam and Putnam at this particular moment in time. Yes. You know? uh, and he's going to look at Kant at, in a particular way. And I just found that very much more fertile and thought provoking than the kind of presumptuousness that tends to go. Of, I'm going to do this. I'm going to show where Putnam is strong or where he's weak. Uh, you know, it's just it's just too That's literal. Important. But I think even that can be done very different ways. So, I mean, even in the thing you just described in those introductions, I'm present in one way, even if, you know, it has a certain diaphanous quality so you can just see through it and not notice me there. I'm present in a certain way, namely, I am picking out that in the way Putnam now sees Kant at that moment and now sees Wittgenstein in that moment, now sees Cavell in that moment, that seems to me particularly interesting, you know, in trying to bring out why I think it's interesting. And so there's a sort of foregrounding and backgrounding and selection that's coming through my own sense of what is philosophically interesting. So I'm not just gone, you know, <laughs> um, you know, you know, the tour guide doesn't, you know, put the buildings in the city, but he decides what to show you. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm giving a very particular tour of Putnam's thought that involves my conception of, you know, you know, this travertine set of steps on this church are particularly beautiful, whereas yeah. another church, you might never have noticed them, you know. Um, so, um, and, um, but you're right, I, I'm, I'm letting, you know, any qualms I have about, you know, something I think, you know, is Putnam's missing about Wittgenstein or the way in which he's grouping people together. Because Putnam is somebody, he's a philosopher who, um, He's a little different than me in this way. He's a little like Rorty in this way, even though their commitments are very different. There's a certain kind of Alec Fleiss's interest in history. I think um, McDowell is a little bit like this. Brandon is very much like this. Rorty's like this. Putnam's like this. They have a set of heroes. They read around, they get a bunch of heroes, you know. You know, Dewey, Kahn, Wittgenstein, um, 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 you know, Cavell, Diamond, one more. but 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 they're able to write sentences of the form. You know, there's a lot of these in Rorty. You know, what Cavell, you know, what, you know, I'm thinking of philosophy in the mirror of nature. What, you know, Dewey, Wittgenstein, and Heidegger are trying to show us is so there, there's a there's a claim out, you know, what philosophy should be and what they're trying to show us. And then you have these three philosophers you know, whose heroes are all trying to do this. It's, you know, I've, I, I would find it very hard to ever write such a sentence. Um, you know, I think, you know, Dewey, Wittgenstein, Heidegger are very interesting philosophers, but they're incredibly different. And I'm interested in keeping their differences in view and not just the facing them. Um, and, um, you know, I have, you know, in some things I've written, especially recently, tried to distinguish different traditions, but then I'm very careful about what the generic features of the tradition are and still allowing for there to be tremendous differences across the people I'm sorting in these gross ways. Putnam is someone who has a bunch of heroes. That tends to be what he's like at every point. Who the heroes are and who falls on and off the list changed a lot. And 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 because of the kind of company they had to keep, his reading of the philosopher on the list maybe changed. Um, and um, so I tried not to write too many things I thought were false, you know, in those introductions about those philosophers. But I wasn't, you know, emphasizing their differences in ways that concerned me. And I was kind of channeling. You know, it's, um, you know, Putnam's sense of them is all kind of, um, you know, pushing in one way, as if there was sort of the good, the good, good way to go and the bad way to go. Um, and, and, and to that extent, there was a, you know, um, an effort of, as it were, escasis of the self, instead of pushing down, you know, my own qualms about doing this this way to kind of articulate what I thought was interesting in Putnam's vision. But then if you read anything I've ever written about Cotton Wittgenstein, I'll bring out similarities and differences and so forth um, <laughs> and so forth for any pair of us people. And um, so, um, and, and I do that in other writings, but you know, there I'm not just trying to say, this is what I think is right. And this is what I was trying to think is wrong. I, I'm trying to still bring out the interest, even of the philosopher I'm distinguishing myself or another philosopher from. So, I mean, this is one thing which maybe um, is a little bit different than what you were asking when you were talking about putting the ego aside. Um, but 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 might be part of what you're responding to, Johnny. Let me just um, venture a, a hazard a guess here. Is 
I think this is true of me, which is I have never taken the time to write something critical in philosophy of anything I myself do not feel the force of. So, I mean, I think a lot of philosophical criticism is trying, is, is people writing stuff where they're trying to demolish something they have contempt for. Mm -hmm. The naturalist just has contempt for the supernatural beliefs, these people that don't realize it all comes down to science. A different kind of philosopher just has contempt for a certain kind of narrow-minded, soulless naturalist, and so forth. You know, see this very much in the kind of atheism God debates. You know, it's a very extreme form of this genre. <laughs> but it's just a lot of philosophical writing, even in the journal literature, where people are just trying to demolish um, the thing they disagree with. And, um, and in many ways, without kind of, I think, fully... Um, appreciating the extent to which they do this because they're mimicking their teachers certain contemporaries exuding contempt for the thing that they're criticizing um and um that is something i've always had a certain horror of it's not that there aren't various forms of philosophy that i don't feel this way about um but i haven't written about it you know um, i don't i've never wanted to write anything that i meant to be a polemic um so any so so I do try to really bring out the force of the opposed view of what I think is wrong with my view. So maybe people experience the criticism as biting, but but anything I've criticized, you know, any reading of a text, Khan or the Tractatus, was one that at one point I felt the force of. Any philosophical temptation I'm trying to bring out and bring out the questionableness of is one I feel or I'm able to make alive in myself is one that I feel the pull of. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, that's true that I do that. Um, now that, you know, doing that is, you know, whatever exercise that is and whatever the right vocabulary for describing it. I mean, it's a little hard to know how it um, fits together with the metaphor of checking one's ego at the door, because in one way it means your ego is a little bit everywhere. You know, my ego is even kind of over with the person I'm criticizing because it's just, it's, it's, uh, there's also a moment of self-criticism in the criticism. Um, so, so it's not a narcissistic form of egoism because it allows for the possibility of self-criticism. And I can both feel the pull of it and want to criticize it while seeing that I feel the pull of it. So, you know, I was wrong and I can be wrong and it's understandable that someone could be wrong. And so, so it's, 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 um, it's not narcissistic egoism, but in another way, you know, um, the I, the ego has to be both in what he's criticizing um, and in the criticism at the same time. And so in another way, the, the you know, um, the ego is more spread out. And so it's sort of hard to use that metaphor to capture this feature of, 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 of at least um, what I've done. Now, that's not to say, just to be clear, that I'm saying this is how you should write philosophy, you should write it no other way. I think there is such a thing as good polemics. Um, and, and, and I think they're very important in politics. <laughs> but um, there is room for them in philosophy, too. But I think that philosophy at the moment consists of much too much too polemic. And, and much too much of philosophical disagreement and division strikes me as more political than philosophical. And I think when philosophy takes the form of people constantly thinking of themselves as taking sides, the way you have to in politics, that that's bad for philosophy. And so I myself, you know, in the age I live in and write in and in the present professionalization of philosophy, have eschewed that and have tried to not do that. Well, that's interesting. And well, actually, how you how you deconstruct my question there, I found very revealing. In fact, it reminds me of something, you know, something we haven't talked about, and I think that Putnam had, was a kind of a, an intelligent elusiveness. And, you know, and he didn't want to fall into that kind of polemical binary dichotomies. I mean, I, I, he answered, I can't remember where it was, but he answered someone at some, he was at some interview. And I think it was Cogito interview. And the, and the interviewer asked him, you know, if you had to make a decision between Hegel and Kant, who would you take? And he said Diderot, which is a beautiful answer. 
Um, and it was a classic Putnam answer because I'm not accepting the basis of that question. And I'm going to give you Diderot because he was the classic, another elusive figure who defies categorization. Yeah, but I think that's also late Putnam, you know. Um, so, um, oh, it is Putnam, late Putnam, yeah. It's certainly not Putnam. Uh, Putnam was a student of Reichenbach and Carnaps. He was never a card carrying logical positivist. He, he's, he's always a fertile thinker, had criticisms of them. But, you know, there was there was a lot of contempt for a lot of things that weren't philosophy as he thought he should do it and has been taught to do it. Um, and there was, it's, you know, and this is the way a lot of people are trained, I think, especially in the analytic tradition, but elsewhere too that you learn how to do philosophy, but you also kind of learn to have a lot of attitudes about things you don't know very much about. You kind of know that these guys and those guys are hardcore soft heads, or you don't need to take them seriously. And so, and so you have ways of categorizing a lot of philosophical thought that you're, you're, you're very little literacy in and, and not feeling threatened by it at all and feeling entitled to be contemptuous of it. And, and Putnam, you know, this is just a fact about the moment of, you know, you know, post-positivistic um, um, analytic philosophy he came out of in the United States um, in the early 50s. He very much imbibed those attitudes. And then in his, you know, incredible project, and this is part of what I admire him, of self-criticism and metamorphosis, he came to see that as explicitly a feature of his own philosophical temperament and education that he wanted to change. So he started getting interested in history and philosophy, he started getting interested in continental philosophy, yeah. started getting interested in Jewish, he's increasingly just sort of wanted to know about anything he didn't know about and was not going to trust, you know, his previous view about it. You know? And, um, and um, but that was very much a change sort of within his lifetime from, you know, being one kind of philosopher to being a very different kind of philosopher. And so it was, it was it, and so it always also, I think, had an aspirational dimension in Putnam. And there was another guy in there who could always break out with a really fierce plumbing. <laughs> and, you, and you, you know, um, you know, a kind of line I, I, I associate with Hillary Putnam is somebody would, you know, you know, ask him a question. He'd say something like, it'd be interesting exercise to count how many things are wrong with that question. You know? And it's, it's a way of just absolutely putting down a question without saying anything. And that's a side of Hillary Putnam too, that goes further back to the early Putnam that never completely disappeared. So he had a kind of complicated, funny person who had, you know, actually I think a tremendous capacity for philosophical polemics, some of which I admire, you know, just demolishing certain views about certain things, you know, um, um, while also wanting to become a very different philosopher than his teachers and he used to be. And then those things coexist in a kind of interesting way in his breast, I think, in his later life. So he's, he's a very hard figure to place here, I think. Well, that's, that actually, that makes him interesting. I don't mean that as a criticism. No, I understand, yeah. If, if we could just change gear now a bit and maybe talk about... We talked about the past uh, and the importance of the past to philosophy. And uh, I'd probably like to ask you about you know some of the philosophers that have had have been a critical influence in you. Maybe we start with, you know, a long dead one, which is Kant. Uh, he's not the only long dead philosopher that's that's been important to you, but it's it's one I'd like to ask you about. I think he, um, and, and why you think he is such an important and interesting philosopher. I, I know that's a very broad question, but um, you can make it as narrow as you want in your answer. Yeah, well, I, I think it's fine. I think it's a perfectly reasonable and fair question. I have no idea what I'm about to say, but let's, let's watch, okay. see what happens. Um, 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 well, there's a lot of ways to answer that question. I mean, um, I mean, in the context of this interview, I think I'll, I'll go at it this way, which is, um, you know, he's as famous as any philosopher could be, really. Um, so, I mean, what, what could be less informative or, or interesting of you than, oh, Kant's an important philosopher. Um, but um, but I, I think, as with some great philosophers, and I think he's a particularly extreme case, there's a weird misfit between how fantastically famous he's taking to be and how much he sort of comes up in a certain kind of way and how poorly understood he is and received he is, especially in the Anglo-American tradition. So I, I guess I think most of what you'll find in the standard Wikipedia-like 
article on Kant. Insofar as it's a description of, you know, his philosophical doctrines, comes closer to being a description of his philosophical targets. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so I think that, you know, what's radical and interesting in Kant is poorly understood. It doesn't mean it was nobody understood it, it had no effect. I think Kant had an enormous effect on philosophy. But so we have trouble gauging because we have sort of trouble seeing what was original and radical and what he did. So, so I, I, you know, I'm not interested in just, you know, I wouldn't be interested in Kant, I think, in the way I did if there was this huge secondary literature in Kant, I thought it was just perfect. I just want to make some teeny contributions. Um, um, I'm sort of interested in sort of reshaping people's, you know, view of who he was and how he can sort of, and then I think, you know, itself, I mean, my interests in this are several. Um, one is that I think, you know, one of the things he did is <coughs> start to have a different conception of where the real shape of the problems of philosophy were, or where the real difficulties were. So some things I've written, um, you know, contrast what I call Cartesian problems, or, you know, problems that belong to what I call a Cartesian problematic that have one kind of shape with Kantian problems. And um, I think we have both kinds of problems in contemporary philosophy, but kind of seeing how they have a different kind of shape and then seeing how they relate to each other is a very helpful thing to do. And, you know, as those labels suggest, I think Kant was the first person who did that, was in a position to do that. So part of, you know, seeing, you know, um, what was interesting, important about him is seeing how he, and this is connected to our very first discussion, um, is how he wanted to change people's shape of what the real question of what the real problem was in order to be able to make progress with it. I mean, the very shape of his intervention in philosophy is something like, there are two extreme views, empiricism and rationalism. And he's not trying to pick the middle. He sees them as sharing assumptions that cause them both to get stuck. So, he, he, um, it's, so it's a, a criticism against two fronts at once in a way that looked um, impossible to people. Um, Secondly, um, you know, on, on more narrow things, I mean, I think Kant thought that the early modern scientific revolution was an enormous step pro forward in the history of man mm -hmm. and a huge breakthrough in science. But it led to a conception of what philosophy was and what it is to have a problem and to solve it that and he, he saw Hume as an example of this Hume's attempt to be the Newton of the mind, that, that a certain kind of metaphysics came with the physics of early modern science that informed people's conception of what it is to give an account of the human being's understanding of him or herself and her powers, and therefore what thinking is and what ethics is and what law is, and that so we, we needed a, a critique of what was the genuine progress in modern science without extracting the wrong morals for it, for how it's an exemplar to do the philosophy about anything. And I think this has been poorly understood, th this aspect of Kant's work, the way in which he's trying to actually recover insights from ancient and medieval philosophy, but sort of situate them, not into a general philosophy of nature, but they're having a role in a certain kind of project of human self-understanding. Um, and so, um, and this gives one a very different conception of what subjects like logic or ethics are than we find in contemporary analytic philosophy, which I think in many ways is still dazzled by the example of the scientific method that was first coming to be articulated in early modern philosophy and has, has been further articulated since. But, but Kant was already beginning a form of critique that I think we still very much need and has been poorly understood. Um, and so I'm, you know, rather than focusing on sort of the doctrine of transcendental idealism, blah, 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 in, in zeroing in the places that people do, um, I'm trying to get a you know, better picture of, of what the very shape of Kant's projects was you know, what was most radical in his thought and how it involves ways of thinking about, for instance, you know, in one thing I've written recently, what logic is, what a power of thinking is, what it is to give an account of this, what it is to see it as failing, which gives one a very different picture of what logic is, um, which I think is a very good thing to have because analytic philosophers tend to act as if they just know what logic is. This is straightforward. You know, you learn this in the intermediate logic class. And that's not up for grabs. And now we need to apply it to various philosophical problems. And I think that's already hugely constricting. So I think in going back to Kant, we're going back not too far, but far enough 
in the history of philosophy and get some distance to see, you know, what are the sources of some of the assumptions that analytic philosophers now see as no assumptions at all. Um, the other thing is I think he's, you know, very interesting marking off point within the analytic tradition. Um, we could draw different strands within the analytic tradition. And, you know, it's interesting the extent to which a number of those figures themselves were very interested in Kant, some of them, and others really hated Kant. Um, and that's something that's not part of the telling of that history. But I think we can see certain fundamental divisions in analytic philosophy is having to do with, you know, how deeply they sort of take the measure of the way in which Kant was trying to introduce a revolution in philosophy, or to what extent they think, oh, this is all garbage, and we can push it aside, mm -hmm. and then just keep going. Um, and so I think some of the people we were talking about before, you know, sort into that story, interestingly, yes. including Hillary, um, um, Barry Stroud, and so forth. I mean, two people took quite very seriously. It's a number of um, people. And that's something that struck me at a certain point. And then finally, another thing that's very interesting about Kahn is he's the breaking off point between, you know, another kind of split in philosophy now, not so much within the analytic tradition, as between what's, you know, rather loosely and I think unhelpfully called, but I'll just allow myself these terms in, an, you know, this kind of interview, um, the analytic tradition, the continental tradition, if, you know, try to trace back their common source, you know, it goes back to Kant and after that, things start to divide. And so that's, you know, the unity that philosophy as a whole has to some extent is the unity it has from all falling from Kant. <laughs> and so I think he's a helpful thing to go back to in trying to, um, if one wants to have a compatious sense of what philosophy is, where we're not just writing out half of contemporary philosophy um, of one's conception saying, those guys are all just soft heads and we're doing the real stuff. Or, or those people are all sort of, you know, dogmatic, scientistic um, naturalists, and we're doing the interesting stuff or whatever. Um, um, it, um, I think Kahn is a, is, is a very interesting figure to keep in one sight. So, so those are some of the reasons that I, I think I keep being attracted to him and find him interesting. But the ways in which I find him interesting is not just, though I'm happy to do this too, write an article in which I say, this is the right way to read the transcendental deduction rather than that way or whatever. But, you know, to extract from him, you know, morals, forms of thinking, forms of argument, and a capacious conception of what philosophy is that can continue to speak to us now and change the contemporary conversation. Yeah. It, well, that's interesting because, you know, a philosopher that you've also, who's also had a big influence on you is, is Hilary Putnam, who's come up a lot in this conversation, but I, his view of Kant really had a huge impact on me. Um, because he kind of helped me understand how Kant helped create a conception of objective knowledge that didn't presuppose this kind of, well, the, the only type of objective knowledge is the kind of absolute knowledge of the world, that kind of scientistic. And I hadn't realized really before Putnam how critical Kant was in helping us see that. Yes. Um, so I'm almost as much indebted yes. to Kant as I am to Putnam. But once you yes. once you kind of see that, it's usually Kant, the way that he influenced philosophy the most, we now take so for granted that we don't appreciate the achievement. Yeah, and it's it's useful to go back and see what it was to sink in some of those thoughts the first time, because then they're not just truisms, but one has to take the measure of, of what it is to think them properly. I think. Yeah, definitely. And um, and it, it's something that you were talking there about, you know, the it defamiliarizes you when you read Kant. You know, you stop looking at the world in the form of certain dichotomies that we kind of inherit and we think are almost absolutes. And that, you know, you can't question those dichotomies. You know, the classic one, fact and value. Well, when you read Kant, ah, that becomes much more problematic. Um well, and very differently framed. I think the closest thing to that in Kant is the difference between the form of theoretical reason and the form of practical reason. Yeah. And first of all, they're united under reason. <laughs> and secondly, distinguishing two forms of reason is very different than what the analytic or philosopher is doing in you know, distinguishing facts and these other weird things, which he's kind of quantifying them, that he calls values, but he's not sure where they and so um, he gives you, I think, a very different sort of way into, you know, that whole topic. Yes, definitely. Okay, well, thanks for talking about Kant in that interesting way. Um, 
another philosopher of the 20th century is is Wittgenstein, who's also been enormously important to you. Um, and I get the impression that one of the reasons Wittgenstein has very been hugely influential is is because of the way he looks at philosophy, as opposed to looking at the doctrines he produces. Um, if I'm right about that, can you maybe talk to that? Yes. Well, I mean, I mean, if I, you know, I mean, it might be useful to connect it with Kant for a minute. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things that Kant aspired to do, which already at the level of aspiration, I think is, you know, worth taking the measure of, um, whether one thinks he succeeds or not, is he wanted an absolutely non-dogmatic way of doing philosophy, a non-dogmatic method. He thought the ways of doing philosophy just involve insisting upon something, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, and then, you know, drawing lots of conclusions from that. And then there was a kind of skeptical reaction to this, where you don't, you don't accept the dogmatic premise, but then it seems like maybe we don't know anything, or there's no God, then there's no right or wrong. Or, you know, so the foundation drops with the dogmatic, pre the, the superstructure drops when the dogmatic foundation is pulled out. And so, you know, as Kant puts it, you get this sort of oscillation between skepticism and dogmatism. Um, and so he's looking for a different kind of method, you know. You know, he can, he has this kind of juridical metaphor where he compares what he wants to do with critique with the way in which a judge, you know, enters a scene of contestation between two parties in the courtroom. And um, he's trying to sort of adduce considerations that nobody can deny and move things forward so that people see things differently without ever slipping a dogmatic moment in. That's his aspiration. I think I think one already reads, you know, his work, starting to critique of pure reason, very differently than one understands that's the method he's trying to practice. Um, so the very way it's described in the Wikipedia argument is, is, is make some more out, like the philosophers that preceded him. Like, has a weird doctrine, he has a weird argument for. <laughs> and if that's all he had, he would utterly be failing to do the thing he's trying to do, you know. Um, um, and and um and so I think this is you know whatever else one says about Wittgenstein, um, this is an interesting, also very radical feature of Wittgenstein's conception of philosophy. One of the things I got in a lot of trouble for saying early on, but now I think is much more accepted, is that this was already true of early Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, and in this way, it's Wittgenstein already starts as Wittgenstein and not as just a member of the Vienna Circle or just a student of Russell, as people sometimes try to make him out to be that he was trying to write a work that um, is practicing a completely non-dogmatic method of philosophy. <clears throat> that, you know, anything that's put forward that someone could just object to is impugned on that very basis as sort of methodologically um, fruit, unfruitful. <laughs> so he's, he's looking for what he calls there a method of clarification or a method of elucidation that allows one to make progress in philosophy without presupposing anything. And, 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 and his conception of what that is over his lifetime from the Tractatus to his latest work, I think, changes enormously. So I don't mean it's just there is an enormous change. But I think it is guided by that aspiration throughout what that involves and how complicated it is. And, you know, early on, he thinks he's just like looking for something called the method, whereas I think later on, he thinks this involves sort of, you know, um, you know, um, moving back and forth between all kinds of different methods that have different roles to play, you know, in tandem with each other. Um, but, um, but that's one thing that makes him interesting to me is sort of looking for a very different conception of how to make progress in philosophy, avoiding dogmatism. And, and, and then another thing I really love about Wittgenstein, this becomes more true as he's older, is I think he remains very alive to the strangeness of philosophy and the strangeness of philosophical questions. He's not, this is one of the ways in which I think he's very un at home in sort of the academic Cambridge philosophical context he's in, is, um, is he doesn't lose that. Um, and um, that's something I value in him, is he helps keep me alive to that, he, you know. We, we have a way of teaching philosophical questions. We just try to make them respectable and get the undergraduate to go. Well, look, you could, you know, if you, you, you start here and you give this argument, it's an open question whether there's an external world or not. It's an open question whether um, there are other minds or, um, 
you know, how can we say what is not the case? You know, how can I talk about, you know, something not being on fire? If there's nothing that is, then there's nothing my sentence is about. So, can, and, you know, we can just sort of, demand, say, don't you see the problem? And we, we treat it as if it was something like, you know, a math problem. Whereas these are very peculiar questions. <laughs> you know, just, you know, really feeling the questions also to allow oneself to feel the peculiarity of it. And I feel like Wittgenstein does not repress this aspect of philosophy. He keeps it alive. That's something I respect about him. The other thing I respect about him very much is that he he very much tries to keep alive and keep himself in touch with, you know, the kinds of responses these questions elicit in us. You know, because I think one of the things that happens in philosophy is we're, we're confronted with a philosophical question. We have a certain kind of spontaneous but somewhat naive response. I don't know. We think something like, well, how could there be anything but, you know, what physics tells us? I mean, physics describes everything there is. That's everything. How can there be? But then this has turned into like some doctrine, you know, which has been made respectable and dressed up as our, we've kind of lost just like the initial mood in which we thought this must be right. And, and what Wittgenstein is very good at is, I think, bringing, going back and not being ashamed of and bringing out almost, you know, in a kind of what somewhat more naive and infantile mood, you know, the mood in which we first express our reactions to philosophical problems, which we then try to make respectable, I think, in various kinds of ways and various sorts of doctrines, but sort of trying to figure out what the initial source is and what the initial perspective of the problem is and see what's sort of already being slipped in the way we think about things in that, as it were, first step into thinking about philosophy, which kind of gets lost once it's dressed up under all kinds of terms like covering law and nominological description and supervenience. <laughs> no, 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 no. We've kind of like lost whatever, you know, the initial, you know, um, you know, step into seeing things this way is that, you know, it's just being taken for granted. Um, so um, that's something I like about him very much. Um, and then I think another thing I like about him very much is that he's a philosopher who um, will go with a certain kind of answer to the question, and he won't sort of just keep it at a respectable level and then try to say what is false about it, which is what we're sort of taught to do when we're writing for the journals. Yeah. But he will really just push that thing through. There is this kind of practice. I've used the word resolute in this connection in certain things I write, you know, resolutely thinking something through. But this is this idea we already find in early Wittgenstein of thinking something all the way through. You know, carrying out the train of philosophical thought to its complete conclusion. And, and it's very good, I think, in showing that you know, one takes a certain step that seems innocent. And then one comes up, I mean, his rule following discussions is a famous example of this, but one thinks, well, of course, whenever you understand what a sign means, you interpret it a certain way. So every act of understanding is an interpretation. Mm. But he will just think this all the way through. What have you committed yourself to the point where it issues in something completely mind-boggling and intolerable and you know he will just follow that out and he won't shrink from that um and 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 um and i respect that i think there's a certain kind of rigor there in not shrinking from the untoward consequences of the direction we're actually moving in philosophy to keep dressing it up and making it look respectable and i think we need to do that i think to really see um what the philosophical stakes are in the different kinds of positions that we take up. Um, and so, um, so that kind of, I don't know how to put it, um, ruthless, <laughs> you know, and um, unabashed, and I don't care what anybody else thinks, but I, you know, the two views that are opposed, it's not like he's doing it to one side to, to make it, you know, seem like the loser. <laughs> He'll do it to both sides. <laughs> um, but um, but um, th th those are all things about, you know, his practice that I, I, I feel like I've learned enormously from. So I find him a very profitable philosopher to read and have a sense of, you know, what one can do in philosophy, what the shape of the philosophical problems are, how we can make progress with them. Um, I do feel like a lot of the way he's proved most useful to me is then to go do some philosophy and try to bring that to bear. Hmm. I have also tried to write things about Wittgenstein where I open up his text so other people free them from the secondary literature, which yeah. I feel like they've been, you know, um, I don't know, straitjacketed. And so that that give other people a sense of how to pick up on these texts and make progress with it so they can provide that kind of resource for other people. But I found that very unrewarding because then one gets dragged into sort of secondary and tertiary debates um, in which I don't feel like, you know, 
genuine understanding or real philosophies at stake anymore, but we just have people's egos who belong to the school of Wittgenstein interpretation rather than that school of interpretation. And they're making the defensive movement to, to fight off your attack. And, you know, the, and the whole, they're sort of keeping score on like which side is winning. And I think whenever philosophy is about which side is winning, it's, it's, it's already ceasing to be philosophy done well. It's turning into politics. And in this case, academic politics, which is, I think, a particularly depressing species of politics <laughs> since the stakes are so low. <laughs> um, so, um, so I have written a certain amount of interpretive things on Wittgenstein, um, and I, I hope some people have found this useful, but I found that to be the less rewarding way of um, kind of going on from Wittgenstein and bringing it to bear than just um, trying to put the insights into practice when I'm writing about other things. Mm. It's funny, when you're talking there about Wittgenstein, the, the, the rigor and yet the freshness of his approach, yes. um, you know, what immediately came to mind the, the you know, when he looks at, when he analyzes the concept of a game and it looks all very, you know, not inconsequential. And then it leads to something really fascinating with the theory of the family resemblances, which then becomes something really philosophically illuminating. Um, and yet it's completely fresh. It's, com it's got real, uh, and it's, and it's got depth and, um, you you so rarely come across something like that in philosophy. Well, well one thing I think um, he's very good at is just sort of looking at what is right before the eyes. Yeah. Our eyes is so obvious that in a way we can't see it. Um, and, um, and, 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 um, and, and a related topic in Vigna, it's something I like about him, and I think it's something that um, can cause other philosophers to be impatient with them. He's, he's always very interested in forms of philosophical skepticism, kind of almost any form of philosophical skepticism fascinates him. Um, but I think um, these two things are actually connected. Um, um, I think he thinks that um, it's kind of, it, it, it's hard to just look at the ordinary. We can't do it, you know. Um, um, it's sort of that which we take for granted, his notion of the everyday of the ordinary. So so what skepticism does is it places it under a kind of threat, which then in order to articulate what it is that's getting lost, that leaves us without a coherent philosophical self-conception, you know, in the area and question, what is it to know another mind or what is it to speak a language or whatever, um, makes what Wittgenstein calls the ordinary visible. Hmm. So, so, I, so I think, I, so, I, um, and I, you know, I think that's true with your example. It's we have a certain kind of philosophical idea of what a concept is and what its unity is, and something like there's some necessary sufficient features that run through every instance of it. You know, you know what makes something a chair is that have legs. Well, that doesn't quite right, but then we want to fix that up a bit, or it makes it a bird so that it can fly. Well, goddamn the penguins, but they still have wings. And then we, you know, and, and but we have a certain picture of like what the unity of a concept must be, and then we also have a kind of skeptical reaction, which is. Well, you know, if we can't find that unity across these uses, then it doesn't really have a fixed meaning. You know, it doesn't really mean anything. You know, it's 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 completely vague. You know, it, you know, there is no clear concept here, and it, you know, it's that pressure of that philosophical issue that then gets you to notice the issue of family resemblances yes. we're interested in, and and it starts to like bring out you know this kind of trivial fact that you know people know that ring around the roses is a game and. People know that football is a game, but it's going to be really hard to say what their common feature is. Mm. And then whatever it is you have, I'm going to be able to name somebody else that's called the game, but it's not going to have that. And, and you know, this, this knowledge you already have, which is absolutely trivial, you know, can come into view for you in a way in which certain philosophical assumptions just blind you to it. Um, so um, so I, th I think um, a couple of things that I was talking about and the thing you're talking about actually all fit together as part of one practice, I think. Yeah. I mean, another philosopher again, that I think is very much in that mode of, well, he makes philosophy fascinating without any loss of depth, is um, Barry Stroud. Yeah, well, I, I mean, he's another figure that I'm an enormous admirer of. Um, I agree with you. Um, he also fits into our conversation nicely. Yeah. And things we've been saying to each other for a while now in a number of different ways. Um, <clears throat> 
he could fit just into the Wittgenstein. Let me make a little list for myself and then we can cut through it maybe. He fits into the Wittgenstein part very nicely. Um, he fits into this question of, you know, trying to come up with a distinctive conception of what the problems of philosophy are, their strangeness and what kind of method is required. Um, he's also somebody who I think, you know, very felt very strongly that as I put it at one point in our conversation, philosophy is one. And he's also somebody who I think bristled enormously against the contemporary form of professionalization of philosophy. So, I mean, we could fit him into our conversation in those four ways, I think. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the Wittgenstein part, I mean, I might point out the very book you mentioned um, starts with an epigraph from Wittgenstein. I'm gonna have the book right here. It's, a nice, it's one of these remarks of Wittgenstein that can seem very small, but it's one of these little depth charges, which if you allow to land into your brain and you think about it, can blow the whole thing to pieces. <laughs> um, and so here's the remark. Um, if there were a verb, meaning to believe falsely. This is actually a translation of German. And in German, it's very easy to put little prefixes on verbs to make verbs. You can just put the word fair in front of things, you know. And, you know, Naaman is to take, fair Naaman is to mistake, you know. <laughs> so it's like, if there, were, if, there were, which, if there were a verb which meant, you know, to misbelieve, you know, in believing, fail to believe something true. But, you know, it's, that's kind of hard to do in English. So Anscombe translates it like this. If there were a verb <laughs> that meant to believe falsely, that's what it meant. So you could say, you know, the verb is, you know, misbelieve. And I could say, yesterday, I misbelieved that my mother was coming today, which means something like, yesterday I had the false belief, I believed falsely that mom was coming today, but actually she's coming next week. Um, if there was such a verb, it would not have a meaningful first person present indicative. Hmm. So if there was a verb that meant to misbelieve, I could in the past tense say, I falsely believe. I could say in something other than the first person, you right now falsely believe that my first language was this, though it's actually that. Um, in the subjunctive, I could say, you know, if I really thought that, then I would falsely believe this, but you know, I don't. But there's no way to have the first person and the present indicative go together where I could say, right now, I falsely believe such and such. Because hmm. if I know I falsely believe it, if I can predicate that verb myself in the first person present indicative, then I don't believe it. <laughs> so, um, so that point about belief, that if there were a verb that meant to falsely believe it, it would have no first person present indicative is kind of the photographic negative of the topic of Stroud's book here with engagement, which is, um, and it's a topic everywhere in Wittgenstein. And I think it's a topic that finds its roots in Kant and before that in Descartes, which is that for verbs like believe, we need to see sort of what's, or, or know, or think, or understand, or mean, these are many verbs who, as Wittgenstein put it, his grammar, he judge, he was trying to investigate. We need to sort of understand the logically privileged position of their first person present indicative use, you know, to not falsely believe, anyway, to believe, <laughs> you know, is such that, um, you know, if I say I believe something, then I can't at the same time stand back from what I believe while still believing it. I can do that from the second person or from the, I could take an outside perspective on somebody else or my former self or my subjective conditional possibilities, but what it is to actually inhabit these kinds of cognitive verbs in the most basic logical use of them is something that doesn't allow for that kind of dis distance or what Stroud will call detachment. The opposite of engagement is detachment. Yeah. And Stroud in this book will stress a lot of our philosophical problems from philosophy wanting to take up a detached perspective to what knowledge, understanding, ethics, and so forth are. 
and, and, and try to bring out how this leads to a certain kind of paradox. And we can't, you know, understand the most fundamental form of what it is we're saying about someone else ourself, unless we understand that the possibility of a sort of detached perspective um, in which we examine such forms of thinking or use require our first understanding a way of being a bearer of such capacities that leaves for no room for such detachment. You know, you could say, you know, a kind of paradoxical way of putting it would be to say something like, the first person present indicative is not a perspective on what I believe. Everything else is a perspective on what I believe. But if I believe it, there's no distance that, yeah. between me and my belief. So it's a perspective. Whereas philosophy tries to understand everything as a perspective <laughs> and then to sort of go perspectival and then figure out how you claw objectivity out of that. I think, by the way, that's a kind of misreading of Kant. I think Kant too thought his perspectivality was very important. But the most fundamental form of the active economy capacity is not a perspective. <laughs> it's it's, it's um, what he calls, you know, um, um, you know, in his somewhat highfalutin language, reason, self-knowledge of itself. Mm. <laughs> um, so this is um, so this is a theme in Wittgenstein that really interests Stroud. It makes him a much better reader, interpreter of Wittgenstein than most people who wrote whole books on him. Stroud has written some wonderful essays on Wittgenstein. It makes him a much better reader of Kant. You know, the way this will come up in Stroud's writing of Kant is the primacy or centrality of judgment. For Kant. We can't understand what belief or merely thinking or kinds of other things unless we first know what it is to judge. <laughs> um, 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 but um, it also then be kind of becomes the central topic of this book. Um, he, he wrote an essay in German. It's only been published in German. Um, um, I know because um, I trans helped translate it for a German philosophy journal. Um, which was a symposium on the book where various people wrote essays, but they first wanted a little pricey of the book, you know, from Stroud. And then people wrote essays on it. And then he replies to the essays. Um, it was just before he died. Um, and um, there's a very nice sentence about the point of the book as a whole, um, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll read you out. Um, even okay. though I, can't, I can't give you an English publication location for it because there isn't one. He says, we thinkers, people who are doing philosophy, we thinkers are the very people engaged in the thinking we are reflecting upon. It is our own position our own engagement in the world that we are trying to understand. And we are trying to understand it from the only reflective position we can occupy. So I think what the word engagement is supposed to mark is the idea that, that unlike trying to understand how electrons work or how nature works, we're trying to understand what it is to think or to mean or to understand or these things that are at the center of philosophy, what it is to have free will, what it is to have ethical beliefs. Um, we can't step back and just investigate it as a phenomenon without losing our very topic. We understand the topic if we understand the topic in such a way that, that the thing we're trying to reflectively understand is something that can only come into view if we are engaged in it in a certain way. Um, and that, you know, part of the paradox of philosophy is it seeks a different form of understanding. Hmm. It wants something that as close as possible approximates the form of understanding we have to something like nature or an object of our own capacities. So it seeks detachment. In the extent to which when it tries to get that, it gets tangled up in all kinds of problems and forms of skepticism. It's dissatisfied. This is the metaphysical dissatisfaction. But, but we also deeply aspire for something other than just our merely engaged understanding. And then yes. this question about what philosophy can do in this trap. Um, and that I think, you know, is what the title is trying to mark as in a very basic way, the shape of philosophical problems of a great many sorts. And that's connected to the thing that I was saying is, you know, Stroud is not someone who just works in one area. Um, 
So, I mean, this book, very strikingly, is trying to bring this out through a certain kind of synoptic survey. So you have an introductory chapter that's kind of bringing out these issues of engagement and dissatisfaction and the shape of philosophical problems. But then it has three main chapters after the one called The Metaphysical Project, and they're on causation, necessity, and value. So one sort of has looks like it's something to do with philosophy of science or something like that. And the other one has to do with like logic and maybe metaphysics. And the other one has to do with ethics. And the people who write about these things are in three completely different areas of philosophy. And he tries to bring out how these three, you know, supposedly very different areas of philosophy, but they're supposedly very different problems, you know, still all exemplify this sort of scheme of, of the shape of the philosophical problem. He's trying to get us to attend to in its most basic shape and see the character of its peculiarity. Now, I don't think Stroud could have written this book unless he was also a very good reader of Kant and Wittgenstein, who was interested in those thinkers, and then he's bringing that to bear. So, you know, he, he does involve some of that, you know, and he's also, he's written excellent things on Descartes. He's one of the, maybe the best book on Hume we have. Um, he did a lot of very fine work in history of philosophy. But then he, when he writes about contemporary philosophy, it's not sort of all historical, but he really sort of try, draws on what's sort of deepest and most interesting in the past to sort of illuminate the shape of the present problems without getting lost in, as you might put it, the minutiae mm -hmm. of the contemporary squabbles. And that's what I think makes almost everything he writes in contemporary philosophy about any debate so much more refreshing and deep is that, you know, he, you know, even if he's talking to a particular person criticizing his view, he's sort of trying to go for the real issue and not just Definitely, yeah. failing to see the forest for the trees. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about Stroud, um, because it fits into our conversation so nicely, is that he's somebody who thought that there were fewer and fewer philosophers that could do this because of the very way in which philosophers were increasing. He was thinking, I think, also of his own PhD students at Berkeley and the kind of PhD program. Yeah. The University of California, Berkeley, was becoming when it was once a program he, he really loved. Um, and, um, and, um, and, and, and this, I think, comes to particularly clear expression in the very opening paragraphs of the preface of another book of his, which is called In Quest for Reality. Hmm. And I'll just read one sentence from that, if yeah, I may. Because yeah. it, um, it brings out this point so nicely. Um, he says, um, philosophy is one subject. And progress in one place in philosophy depends on the resolution of issues that lie elsewhere. One is led, I think he's saying, if one does philosophy well and seriously and deeply enough, one is led eventually into almost all the other areas and questions of philosophy. And this is certainly true of what we find in the philosophical work of the great philosophers of the past. Against that high standard that those great philosophers of the past have given us, the current professional fixation on distinct, quote, fields, unquote, or, quote, areas, unquote, of academic, quote, specialization, unquote, and, quote, competence, unquote, <laughs> looks like no more than a bad joke. <laughs> so, um, so that's a very powerful, just powerful expression of kind of cry from the heart against certain things that are happening in philosophy in its contemporary form, as I know of, you know, in any contemporary philosopher. And I think it's not an accident that we find it in Stroud's writing at the beginning of that book. That I think he thinks once philosophy gets subdivided into these little areas and we can't see beyond them and we're sort of concerned with where, what our students are appropriately cred credentialized just in sort of um, expressivist analytic meta-ethics in those debates that this is a kind of death of philosophy <laughs> for Stroud. Um, and um, so that's another way in which he's an important figure for me. He's someone who sort of helped embolden me to think something similar and, and see an example in his work of a very different way of doing philosophy that still a lot of people find helpful and useful. Yeah, that, that, thanks. That was, that was a lovely um, kind of treatment of, of, um, of Stroud. Um, and as you say, brought a lot of the threads of our conversation together uh, in a very neat way, um, and, and the kind of the tragedy of that is that really there's so few Strouds around today. You know, uh, he is the exception almost that proves the rule. Well, I um, think they're dying fast. I mean, already you know, ten, fifteen years ago there were many more, but 
you know, with the passing of, you know, people like Donald Davidson, Elizabeth Anscombe, um, um, Hillary Putnam, Stanley Cavell, I don't know, you know, Michael Domino, we could, the list goes on and on, but that generation is kind of dying out. And this generation is not initiating people into philosophy in a way that makes it very easy for them to be like that. They just have to, you have to swim so hard against the current now mm-hmm. <laughs> to become a Stroud. Um, so, um, so I do think you're right that, that, that it's, he's a dying breed in the English speaking world. Well, that's good because uh, what I'd like to now talk to is a philosopher who you have written about and who actually is anything but provincial. Um, and that's Richard Warty. Um, and, you know, he, he had an interesting relationship with the, you know, I know we, we, we've said they're not, they're not great labels, but he was, he was certainly interested in, in certain continental philosophers uh, in a way that most analytic philosophers in that narrow sense weren't. But you've written, I think, very interestingly about Warty, um, a bit like Putnam did. I mean, he, was, he, he found Warty both interesting and troubling. Um, and there's a kind of a, there's an ambivalence. There's an ambivalence here uh, that, you know, he's writing about, he's writing interestingly about interesting things, but there's this kind of worry about it. So maybe could could you talk maybe a little bit about why you think Warty's interesting and significant, but also where you might think he's troubling and maybe even wrong? Yeah, I can do all those things. I mean, maybe I'll start by saying something about why he was important for me biographically. Yeah. And 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 I I think what I will say about myself will not be true for only me. So it, it will bring out why he was historically, you know interesting thing to happen. <laughs> um, so his book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, <coughs> came out in 1979. <coughs> so I was still an undergraduate, quite young. I, um, you know, I was 21 years old. I was still three years from graduating college on the trajectory I was on. Um, so this is, you know, I'm, I'm not that philosophically formed <laughs> you know, when I come upon that book. But I've also, I've already, you know, poked around enough to notice that you know most of the philosophy courses in Harvard are of a certain sort. They call themselves analytic philosophy, um, and um, a lot you know it's a certain amount that you know I thought I kind of thought might belong to philosophy, which I could find in another department, but I couldn't find in the philosophy department, except maybe in Cavell's classes. But at that age, I couldn't understand them, so they didn't help me. <laughs> so, uh, and. Um, and Rorty, um, you know, Rorty's book was someone who's, who's trained as an analytic philosopher. He was clearly very knowledgeable analytic philosopher. He was writing in some detail about certain analytic philosophers, but it was also trying to sort of open up the tradition to things that were outside of it. <coughs> One of his heroes was Kuhn, who was somebody I know about. Another was Wittgenstein, who was somebody I was interested in. Another one was Dewey, an American pragmatist, or something else I saw was sort of interesting. Another was Heidegger, who was a philosopher I've always been fascinated by, but I found very difficult. <coughs> to, to really um, be very secure in my understanding of. Um, and these, these, the, all these names were flying around in Rorty. And they weren't just flying around there on the page, but they were sort of grouped together as this sort of star of Bethlehem by which we can navigate ourselves out of, you know, the darkness and the narrowness of what analytic philosophy, which even I think on Rorty's own telling was originally a very interesting movement, had kind of collapsed into and in a sense, I think it was ahead of his time because I think a certain sense that analytic philosophy, at least in some of its intellectual fashions, had entered into a certain kind of sterility was something that grew in the decades after Rorty wrote. And when Rorty wrote it, he was um, a bit more of an oddball and ostracized for saying it than he might have been if he'd come later. Um, um, but so I, I was, I was, I gravitated towards that book. I read it more than once. Shortly after that, Consequences of Pragmatism came out, which is a collection of essays. I read those and I tried things down. So I was sort of reading everything I could get my hands on by Rorty. And, um, and I think this was true of a certain number of people, you know, who were both had some literacy in analytic philosophy and were trained in it, but also sort of wanted their philosophical horizons to not, as it were, be defined by the limits of the horizons of what, you know, the institutionalization of analytic philosophy at that moment, late seventies, early eighties, conceived of it as in a certain kind of rear guard action. Um, um, so, um, so there was something um, 
exciting. It seems something exciting about Rudy. And I think a lot of people share that excitement. And for instance, to take a philosopher whom I know quite well, who's somewhat, you know, a generation older than me and an important philosopher, John McDowell. You know, I know that, you know, something similar could be said about him, though obviously he was in a different age, um, in a different and a much more distinguished moment in his career when he came upon this book, but it helped kind of open up horizons and interest him in history and interest him in certain authors and, and, and kind of provided a kind of permission for sort of, you know, loosening up his own relation to the tradition in which he'd been um, educated in. And I think it had a secondary kind of effect to somebody who was already sort of making that move independently to some extent, Hillary Putnam and so forth. And I mentioned those people, McDowell and Putnam, you know, in addition to myself, because they were all very critical of Rorty's views, you know, kind of once they got clear what they were. But, you know, the first thing about Rorty, which was sort of exciting, was a little bit independent of the details of his views, which was just the way in which he was creating a conversation in which Quine and Goodman and, you know, um, <coughs> and, uh, you know, a limited materialist like Churchland and all kinds of other, you know, mainstream Alec philosophers and Dewey and Kuhn and Heidegger and Wittgenstein were sort of all part of it once, you know, it, it didn't seem like a possible form of, you know, way of convening philosophy. So suddenly, you know, you know, out of the Tower of Babel was emerging this United Nations in which these people could at least treat each other with some respect to be in conversation. It was, it was sort of what's happening here. You know, it's just very eye catch. <laughs> um, and so, um, and so, I mean, I think it's the first thing to say about Rorty. Um, another thing that, to say about Rorty, which I liked very much, is he is somebody who thought that philosophy should matter. And I think one of his critiques of Alec philosophy is it created a kind of infertility in which it didn't really matter to anybody except the people who were caught up in those debates. And something from which philosophy drew its life, you know, had been lost, you know. For Rorty, this especially meant matter politically, but it didn't just mean that, you know, he felt that reading a novel or, you know, humanistic works, you know, spoke to you in a way in which philosophy no longer did as it become the Alec tradition. So, so it, it neither mattered, we could say to you, as privately as a person or publicly as a citizen. It was just ceasing to matter and that philosophy should matter and that indeed philosophy one of philosophy central questions i would have thought was what should matter what matters and if the way it discusses the question what matters becomes a form of discourse in which it that discussion doesn't seem to matter it somehow seems to i think have lost its topic which i think is kind of what happened in analytic metaethics <laughs> um and so um so i like that about rorty uh, another thing I liked about Rorty is, you know, that he was interested in the history of philosophy and he had a very wide level of erudition and, and he wanted to sort of break boundaries about which things you could talk together about. And he was just completely sort of unmoved by any of those fashions. And he wasn't afraid of people saying, you know, you, you don't have the competence to discuss that. Rorty would know nothing about Derrida and pick up Derrida and write an article about Derrida. And then he would read something else and he'd write an article about that. And, and um, there was something about that that did seem to sort of issue a certain permission slip um, that, um, you know, um, it felt very transgressive. <laughs> um, so um, there was, yeah, a moment of transgressiveness in Rorty that was also gratifying and exciting. So there's a lot of things. And another thing about Rorty, which I think, you know, is a little bit more parochial, but mattered to me, maybe mattered to a few other people. Maybe it's an aspect of Rorty that I cared more about than most. Is that you know he he was somebody who kept his own identity in view you know so the I that spoke was Rorty he wanted to say something about who he was and why things mattered to him and then one part of this is that he was an American and and he wanted philosophy he wanted to know what it was for philosophy to be American and so that also gave him an interest in figures like um, Dewey and Peirce and James but also secondarily even Emerson and Thoreau and Royce. And, um, you know, and also, you know, certain even contemporary philosophers who are a little more interested in the question of what it is to be an American of different sorts, you know. Um, and so, um, and, and, and that, that I thought, you know, was a question I wanted to understand. I think it was alive for me in the way maybe it wasn't for other people, because I had always grown up knowing I was American, but also not growing up in America. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so it was, um, there's a certain kind of way in which you can take for granted, you know, 
you know, what it is to be an ex without really understanding it, which, you know, I kind of in the quite the same way. And so I want to know what it is to be American, but also therefore what kind of unity is formed by um, having the predicate American in front of the word philosophy. And if what it is to be American has a different conceptual shape than what it is to be German or French, then the way the predicate modifies the noun should be different too, I think. And Rudy was someone who, I don't think he would have put it that way, but seemed to me sensitive to this issue that America itself was in some ways a certain kind of a philosophical project. And so, or a certain kind of project. It wasn't just a matter of, you know, sharing a common language or race or geography, but it was, it was built on a certain kind of vision. So it wasn't just external to a certain conception of what philosophy um, itself understands itself to be doing. Um, and I like that about Rudy. So kind of in the large kind of, you know, I don't know how to put it, somewhat out of focus, at a distance, picture of Rudy's philosophy. There were a lot of things about it that attracted me. You know, when I took two steps closer and, you know, and I wasn't just kind of dazzled by the whole thing and squinting and I, you know, developed the right kind of sunglasses to look at this big, bright, shiny thing <laughs> and was able to get things sort of fully resolved. Um, there was a lot I found to be dissatisfying in the details. You know? <coughs> One thing um, about Rorty, <coughs> um, I, I came to feel, I mean, one thing about Rorty is when you first read him, he seems really exciting. It's very hard not to read him. Um, and this is an interesting fact about him and who his written persona is in a way. Um, as having some sort of something Promethean and kind of almost Trotskyite permanent revolutionary about him, you know, so you just take some line from Rorty, I don't know, we're nothing but interpretation all the way down, you know, that's sort of how I read that sense. It wasn't clear to me it was true, I agreed with it, but, you know, there was just a certain kind of like excitement to it, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, as I put, I mean, I don't know if like Nietzsche or Trotsky, who's the right metaphor here, but, but you know, certain kind of like, you know, ah. but then when you met Rorty and I got to know him and talk to him and wrote about him and was involved in exchanges with him, I realized, you know, when Rorty delivered that line, it was like this, it's nothing, we're nothing, we're nothing but interpretation all the way down. <laughs> and, you know, and it felt more like, um, you know, it was, it was almost hard to get the sentence out and it was sort of pushing it out over someone who just taken sort of 10 doses of value. Um, and, um, and that there was something very depressed and, and, and that there was a kind of um, somebody who's trying to keep himself from being depressed. Um, and I kind of came to appreciate this was somebody who was very bitter and disappointed in his philosophical education as an analytic philosopher, and more generally, maybe even as a philosophy student before he became an analytic philosopher at the University of Chicago, there were certain sort of high philosophical ideals and a certain kind of metaphysical picture into which he was initiated. And then he came to be very, very disappointed with that. And he started, I think he felt that someone like, you know, all of this philosophy is this like enormous con game and it doesn't, it doesn't work, and it doesn't go through. And so you got this sort of stream kind of skeptical recoil. And, and so, um, his, his interest in history had a kind of historicist skeptical edge and his interest in traditions also was born out of a kind of this, he's not trying to open up analytic philosophy, you know, to something else, but he was partly just trying to like escape his previous identity for something else he didn't know what, which I don't think is, um, this is almost something adolescent sort of teenager who's just sort of running away from home in search of who knows what, you know, you're, you're kind of vulnerable to, uh, to indoctrination by a religious cult, if that's where you are in life. And I felt like Rorty was just kind of going through one enthusiasm after another when I looked at it more closely. And so um, in, in, in the way in which he wasn't able to hang on to very much conviction with anything that went very deep in his previous, and he, he kind of was reacting against the whole thing wholesale. And that this underlying disappointment and bitterness was you know, very important to what he stood for. Um, I also thought there was, you know, this led to a very kind of crude pragmatism. So yes, I really liked the idea that he wanted philosophy to matter. But in Rorty, this became how can philosophy help us cope right now with our most immediate philosophical problems? It's like, how can philosophy bake bread? You know, and I don't think, you know, a certain kind of overly, 
utilitarian or consequentialist or instrumentalist conception of what the immediate payoff of philosophy is going to be is the best way of understanding how philosophy matters or, um, uh, or, or, or where its value lies. And so this led to some, you know, I thought, you know, coarseness in what Rorty championed and what he, what he um, denigrated because of why he thought it was going to sort of help the political moment you know, in, in a very, very, very sort of narrowly instrumentalist way. Um, so I, I came to not really like the connection between the politics and the philosophy. Not that there was one, which I liked very much, but, um, the, you know, the, the, as it were, crudeness of the journey. Um, and um, in which the philosophy, you know, kind of was um, the handmaiden to a, a political ideological agenda itself that wasn't really being subjected to philosophical scrutiny. Um, um, and um, finally, um, you know, Rorty's disappointment with, you know, the traditional philosophical ideals of, you know, a kind of transcendent meaning or a kind of, a tr you know, the possibility of truth. Um, um, we can mention quite a few other concepts. Um, a, you know, a certain conception of, you know, what it would be to know reality or a certain conception that, you know, we're capable of a certain kind of objectivity, a certain kind of conception of impersonality, of putting your ego aside is an important thing to be, you know, the judge can do in the courtroom or all kinds of people can do in certain kinds of situations. Where do you came to see all of those concepts of impersonality, objectivity, truth, um, um, any kind of tradition transcendence as itself just hostages to bad, as he would put it, realist with a capital R, metaphysical with a capital M pictures. And so the, what he was criticizing, I agree with his criticisms of, there was this hardcore recoil. You know, in a way that I think, you know, I would say things a bit like what I was saying in our brief conversation about Quentin, seemed to me to um, involve assumptions that he continued to share with the with the views he was criticizing, the education he had, and he was much more hostage to it than he thought, while he thought he was leaving it behind. And so um, the, some of the more detailed things I've written about Rorty has then been on those issues, about relativism, objectivity, and truth. Um um, and, and why I thought, you know, Rorty's picture is if we think about truth this way rather than that way, it will fit with the politics we want much better. And that's why we should think about that. So there's, this, there's this political, you know, justification. And um, I thought it was a bad way to think about truth, period. It could be argued in its own terms. And that tends to be how other analytic philosophers argued with them. But I was always, this is connected to things we were talking about before. I always tried to about Rorty, write about Rorty in a way that Rorty himself would feel the force of. Um, and so I was a little more inclined, not because I think we needed to go around the barn in this way, but I thought going around the barn in this way was the way to make contact with Dick, um, was to say, this doesn't even give you the politics you want, you know, you know, throwing out the concept of truth this way is no better. Is there's nothing better you can do to be the friend of the fascist, <laughs> and um, <coughs> which is also right. I think I don't think it's the reason, you know, we should think about truth this way around that way because we want to have this politics around that politics. Rather, I think. You know, having the right politics involves, you know, being clear about what truth is. <laughs> and so, it's, you know, it's a little bit, you know, putting the cart before the horse. But I, I tried to write these things where I tried to speak to Rorty and also to some of Rorty's admirers who were undergraduate or graduate student pairs of mine and shared some of my aspirations for philosophy. But then in their sort of thrall to Rorty's writings, I thought, you know, we're not, you know, going in a direction I wanted to see philosophy go. And I was very sorry that, you know, these people that had a chance of being a bit of a vanguard and making things more interesting were kind of all going Rorty. Mm -hmm. So um, so the more detailed things I've written about Rorty have been more focused on these issues, and we can talk about them. But, so, um, before you go there, Jim, what strikes me that you it seems to me that you, you sort of see Rorty as a kind of a disappointed Platonist. That's right. That, I think, is a very good description of Rorty. He's a disappointed Platonist. Um, and the other thing and, that, and, and he's never going to get cheated again. Yeah. He's a disappointed Platonist, and he wants a philosophy that cannot disappoint him again. Yeah. And, and that's a certain motivation to philosophy that goes back to ancient Stoicism, you know. 
to have a way of looking at things that makes you invulnerable to disappointment. <laughs> um, I mean, Rorty would be very surprised to be described as a modern day Stoic, but I think there's a funny way in which <laughs> that's what he is. <coughs> and and um, that also makes it very hard to um, have any ideals or to see the ideals in certain concepts we have, which are hard to realize. And so what you wind up realizing winds up being something that, you know, plays into the hands of your enemy who wants to destroy those ideals in ways you don't appreciate, I think, even just politically. <laughs> I think, you know, you, you gave a nice positive and, 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 you know, the ledger there, you know, the, uh, the credit and the, and the debit there of Rorty. And, but I think, you know, he's also a much maligned philosopher. Um, you know, I mean, you can acknowledge the differences with Rorty that are significant and serious without in any way having to go down, because I think he was really badly maligned by a lot of analytic philosophers. Yeah, who, I've never tried to do that. I always tried to write him in a way that I felt he would feel it, the force of what I was saying myself. I wasn't trying to write for my, some analytic cohort where we could sort of share our contempt for him. No. And I, I never tried to do that. I agree. I also, something else, you know, it's contained in everything I said about Rorty, but, um, but it wasn't kind of brought to the surface. So maybe it's worth saying is, I mean, this is something I admire about him. I admire in any philosopher who can pull it off and there aren't that many is, you know, damn it all. He was very much his own philosopher. You know, he had his own vision. He, he, he wound up striking out in very much his own path where, you know, it's a very different kind of unity of thought and sensibility that spoke to people and just having such figures itself shapes philosophy in different ways. Even if like what I'm doing or McDowell is doing or Putnam's doing is reacting to Rorty, you know, it, it's some a very interesting and different thing to react to, which itself enriches philosophy. And so, I mean, that's something, it's why I've always thought Rorty was worth talking about, was worth teaching. I do bring him into my classes. Um, <laughs> I think what, what, you know, unlike a lot of analysts, a lot of philosophers, professional, he had real nerve, he had a nerve uh, that was unassailable and irreducibly, <laughs> Well, and that's what I really liked your essay on 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 Rorty and Orwell on truth. Yes, which I thought was a serious engagement with a topic that was of vital importance to Rorty, and yet you were you were engaging with Rorty on probably the most important thing he could think about. Yes, and then sort of saying, "Well, here are the problems, Dick, you know, Richard, with yes. your your way of trying to make Orwell vital, yes. and you've done it, you've done it wrong." By, by sacrificing the truth. Yeah, I mean, I also tried to write that essay in a way that would not lead to Rorty's usual reaction. So that was an essay that was resolute in the sense that I tried to really find my way into Rorty's mind. I looked at how he responded to things. You know, he's very quick at dismissing almost every criticism of him. And I tried to, as it were, you know, disarm all of those. So, at the very least, he would have to have a different reaction. Mm. So one thing I did is I put down a lot of sentences that just showed that I could repeat exactly what Rorty wanted to say. So, so it's not that I didn't know what he wanted to say about this issue of imagination. Here it is. It's what Rorty wants to say. Tried to put it as well as you know he ever did, so he could go. God damn it! You know he seems to understand what I want to say. And then what Rorty would do in a lot of his criticism say, well, if you disagree with me about this then you believe that, you know, there's this inquiry independent notion of truth, you know, that stands outside of history. And this requires a God's eye point of view. And I don't think we can make it. So I also stated the view that Rorty thought was the alternative to his view that you're immediately committed to for like eight different points. Um, if you don't agree with him and I made it clear, I agreed with him in disagreeing with that view so that I wasn't, um, that it wasn't going to be easy to just charge me with holding the thing he thinks because I liked his criticism of those views. I thought there was something in it, but I didn't think its rejection took us to Rorteanism. Yeah. So, I mean, I had a kind of very detailed statement of sort of eight aspects of metaphysical realism and eight aspects of Rorteanism. And then I tried to bring out how there's room in between and that a lot of Rorty's forms of argument is not this, therefore that. Um, where there's sort of two doors. And, it, and I also try to bring out how this is very much the way the analytic philosopher thinks. One of the things I tried to bring out about to Rudy, which I knew he wouldn't like, but I thought was true, is how much of an analytic philosopher is. 
<laughs> which, which is of course, you know, in a way, the worst thing you could say to Rorty. You know, it's like, uh, it's 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 like you know, accusing Dawkins of being a you know Christian down, deep down or something. You know, um, um, but, uh, um, who believes in the Eucharist? Um, um, but uh, um, so, uh, but you know, I do think that is what he is. <laughs> He's an analytic philosopher. Um, more than I am, um, and, and, and in certain respects. And I, I, so I tried to bring that out. And then I tried to frame the whole thing around Orwell, who I knew was just his favorite author. Mm. And I, because there's another feature of Rorty I didn't mention, but something I did not like about Rorty. Um, and it's the opposite of what I think of as the ideal and resolute readings. And I also think this is very typical of how an analytic philosopher reads text, which is whenever Rorty talks about anybody, name anyone, even philosophies he likes, like Dewey, Wittgenstein, Heidegger. There's the good doing, the bad doing. There's the good Wittgenstein, the bad Wittgenstein. There's the there's the left Salarsian side of Sellers and the right Salarsian side of Sellers. You know, for any you know any philosopher he talked about, he quickly noticed that he didn't say everything like. And so he just drew a line and said, "This is the side of my life where he agrees with me and all of my heroes, and here's the other half of them. I don't know what it's doing there, and it doesn't fit, and I'm against that." So here's the Heidegger I love. And then there's all these other facts about Heidegger that don't fit into that. That's the bad Heidegger. So I mean, another, and that, so, so on the one end, you have a philosopher who says, it's really important we read these figures and we read these texts. And uh, the other thing I was trying to bring out about Rorty is actually he's incapable of reading. He's only able to find Rortyanism. <laughs> and, um, and that reading you know, requires um, seeing the unity of these different philosophers' thoughts and why it all hangs together. If they're at all good philosophers, and these are great philosophers, there is a certain unity. But that means the stuff you don't like isn't just saying what you think it is, but that means stuff you do like isn't just saying what you think it is either. Um, um, and they can't all be thrown in one box. Um, and um, I mean, there's a number of philosophers, especially analytic philosophers have this tendency to just divide people up and talk about the good side and the bad side, which I think is part of, you know, a way of approaching historical texts that belong on that second end of the spectrum we were talking about before. Um, because, you know, even, even the, the, the people that are least attentive will start to notice lots of things don't fit what they want the guy to be saying. Um, and, and so I also thought that was true of him and Orwell. And then I tried to bring that out in Orwell, you know, that... Um, it's interesting because he does that with, he does that with Rawls. He does it with everyone. He yeah, really does it with everyone, I promise you. Yeah, he does it pretty much. Yeah, it's got a schizophrenic, um, the, you know, or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and it's one or the other, you know. Yeah. The, um, well, with, with, with Orwell, I was trying to show that the sentences of his he really doesn't like, where Orwell talks about objective truth, yeah. are at the center of everything Orwell thinks. They're, they're not this sort of unfortunate outcropping of this guy who's otherwise a roaring historicist. Yeah. Um, and um, whether, they, whether they're the novels or whether they're not. Um, and I also thought Orwell's a particularly good point, because good case, because I thought his reading of Orwell is, in fact, profoundly perverse, you know. The idea that you know that you know um, that O'Brien is the hero of 1984 rather than you know the apocalyptic vision is just very strange reading of it. <laughs> okay, um, this kind of brings us to the probably last topic I, I want to cover, uh, Jim. If we're okay with that, and it's really yeah, I could, can... I say one, could I say one thing about that which you might be interested in? I, um, which is you know, you know, one of the things that that Orwell says. Um, which I kind of zero in on, and I think is very interesting, is not part of Rorty's picture of it. Orwell draws an enormous contrast between the end of the First World War and, the end, and then um, something he already thinks has happened by the Spanish Civil War. So this is the development that took place in the first decades of the 20th century. And he argues and, and gives some evidence for the claim that um, at the end of the First World War, if you looked at what a French or a German or an English or an American historian said about the First World War, the battles, who won them, who lost them, how many died, which generals made stupid decisions, you know, who had better barbed wire, you know, whatever you want. Um, um, there's an enormous amount of historical consensus. You know, there might be some slight shading uh, you know, uh, some ways for the German things and, you know, the British, you know, certain British historians not quite fessing up to how unbelievably incompetent, you know, the British generals were and whatnot, but, you know, it, um, but, um, 
But there's an enormous amount of consensus and the telling of those things. And they're also citing each other. You know, it's one body of literature they're all literate in. And so there's a history of the First World War that was both being written when it took place to some extent, but especially after it took place, in which there's a shared body of historical fact against which, you know, any political or philosophical or any other interpretation takes place. And that by the time you got to the Spanish Civil War, you had something in the Spanish Civil War you didn't have anymore. That if you looked at a certain left-leaning press or a certain right-leaning press, even just in, you know, London, you know, let alone, you know, in Italy or Yugoslavia or Russia or, you know, um, um, you know, the United States, um, you had completely different reports of what were going on. There were great victories that weren't even reported battles. And, um, yeah. and there were great atrocities that weren't even mentioned. And so the people that were sort of cheering on this war from afar and, and, and volunteering to go fight in it or, or, or donating money towards it, were not experiencing the same events at all. Well, Guernica is a classic example. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and he said he found this completely frightening. And this, this is the context, I think, that essay, looking back in the Spanish Civil War, is I think, you know, the background for then his experience in the Cold War, beginnings of the Cold War and writing 1984. And in that essay says, and when this happens, I begin to have the feeling, you know, that the concept of objective truth is fading from the world. And, um, and, and that was something in Orwell that did not interest Wordy at all, because it is an interest in the concept of objective truth. He wanted to destroy it. And which I thought was, um, you know, incredibly spoke to our age. And I, you know, I was reading these Rorty essays and also reading the Orwell they were based in while I was teaching and lecturing in Greece. And this was when um, the Bosnian Wars were going on under Clinton. And for various reasons, the Greeks were very sympathetic with the Serbians. And so I was getting a kind of news reports on, on Greek television and the Greek newspapers, which was, which was much closer to the Serbian account of what was happening in that war. Um, while at the same time, um, you know, I was reading, you know, I was, I'm an American. I was going out and buying the New York Review of Books and the International Herald Tribune and, um, and, um, you know, reading, you know, essentially excerpts from the New York Times, the Washington Post, in which, you know, it was a very different war going on, you know, <laughs> and, and I was, and, and so I realized I was in great political disagreement with my young Greek philosophical friends who I admire and I respect and I thought they're interesting. And many of whom thought of themselves as very leftist but are supporting Milosevic's side in that war, you know, because they're seeing this as a kind of American imperialist aggression, you know. And it's like very, at first I just couldn't understand how could these like people are much more leftist than anybody I know in the United States, you know, who, who want, you know, the 1968 Paris barricades at the university back, but they're supporting Milosevic, you know. <laughs> I just literally don't understand it. And then I realized, you know, here I was in such an ecosystem where, I had been fed one story about a war and they're fed another one. And, and um, so we didn't have a common basis in fact, and, and to have an intelligent conversation about this required digging this out. And then this has just become much more extreme with each decade. And now in the United States, you know, the election of Donald Trump, you were saying, how could 70 million people vote for him, you know, given what he's done? And I said to you, seven, those 70 million people don't have your view of what he's done. Um, they're, they're, they're in a completely different media ecosystem, um, which they have a completely different set of beliefs about what Joe Biden has done. You know, he's cheated and he's corrupt and his son has done these things and, and, and you know, all kinds of other unbelievable conspiracy theories. I don't even want to repeat in this interview no. so I don't want to give them any credibility. But, um, but, 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 but so this, this Orwellian worry has, you know, taken on, I think, ever more historical determinacy and reality and an unfortunate kind of efficacy over the last few decades um, since I wrote that essay. And I and so the thing I thought I'd report, which has been very interesting to me is, especially during this election, I've gotten lots of emails from people who said, I've just gone back and reread your essay on or Orwell and Rorty and Freedom, Cruelty and Truth. And, 
it, 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 I've gotten all these emails about that essay during this election season and um, people asking me if I could write something else about it. There's two things I wrote. I also wrote an essay called In the Electoral Colony, which was about the counting of the votes in 2000 when the election was very close. I, I, their kind of the mediating figure in my discussion of this is not Orwell, but Kafka. Um, but, um, but, um, but I've also gotten some emails mentioning that or sometimes both essays. Um, so, um, so I do think these issues that I was disagreeing with Rorty about um, have, if anything, acquired, you know, even more significance and importance mm. over historical time. And there's a kind of internal related issue also about how to think about America and the right or wrong ways of thinking about America so that it's both a concept of a possible place that one can take pride in without it turning into a concept of America, which is actually toxic in the way that it becomes, you know, in Donald Trump's, you know, purported articulation of, of what it stands for. And, and those were possibilities that were already there. <laughs> and I, one thing I think I didn't like about Rorty is the way in which he wasn't able to distinguish those things properly. So that some of what he was in, he was arguing in his sort of metaphysical and epistemological mode, while arguing that metaphysics and epistemology should be tied to ethics and metaphysics, actually was corrosive in a way that leads to very much the opposite ethics and politics from the one he wants. Well, that's interesting because when you were talking there about the, the kind of paradigm shift between the First World War and the Spanish War, I was reminded of the famous, at the end of the First World War, you know, the, the leaders, the statesmen around together and, you know, they said, I wonder what historians will make of this. Yes. And Clemenceau famously said, well, they won't say that Belgium invaded Germany. Yes, yes. And I think, you know, we've even lost sight of that. Right, that's exactly Orwell's point. He's, he thought starting, you know, reports of the Spanish Civil War, you know, were very unclear about who even started and who invaded what and, and so forth, who committed atrocities. And then, of course, it's gotten much worse since then. I mean, when you look at what, 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 what happened in Guernica, yeah. and you look at the way it was initially bombed by the Germans, Yes. Then the Frank, the Franco, the fascists come in and put bombs that looked like they they were they about to make them look like they were detonated by rebels. Yes. So they they constructed uh, a, a situation after the bombing. Yes. So there you have a, a falsification. Yes. Uh, which undermines even the possibility of truth. <clears throat> right, but that's a transitional moment, right? Um, the 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 Franco forces are really fighting a war and trying to win it on the ground. Yeah. While they're also, as it were, manipulating the media and trying to give a false narrative of what's going on. I think it's not, you know, it's not a gross exaggeration to say over the last four years, Trump has given almost no thought to governing at all. And he's invested almost all his energy in sort of creating narratives and falsifications that could compensate for however the governing is going on, because it doesn't matter as long as you get your narrative out there. As long as we're turning the corner, it doesn't matter how many people are dying of coronavirus. As long as you're manipulating the stock market, it doesn't matter what's actually happening with the economy, you know, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, and, and so, um, and so, um, so it's, it's sort of, you know, what is there, sort of the, the tail that starts to get wagged by the dog itself becomes the thing that wags the dog, you know, and, and, and this sort of more terrifying development of things. If we could just maybe, we might bring it to an end, uh, this conversation, um, Jim, because I'm, I'm conscious we've been now on for three hours, but we've, it's been a great, fascinating conversation. And one of the reasons I've really enjoyed reading your work and why it's been so inspiring to me is because it actually shares so many of the virtues of the people we've talked about. Um, and I, I can see the influence of their work coming, shining through your work. And I think what, what really impact what really asserts itself when I read your work is this combination between, well, I think, I think it was Miles Burney, I call it a vision and argument that you, you uh, so much, so much contemporary philosophy is just argument without any vision. And by vision, I mean, imagination, I mean, cross-disciplinary uh, yes. a viewpoint, a bit like what, you know, um, Stroud was, it was kind of creed occur when he said, it's a bad joke. Because the specialization is actually ending up murdering the subject of philosophy. Right. Um, so could you give us a sense of you know where you're going, how you found 
how your how your own career has developed. Do you think you've grown as a philosopher, and where do you think you're going with philosophy? Um, well, I'll, tr I'll try to say something to those rather difficult questions, but let me just comment on what you said. I mean, I do think the direction of, you know, strangling philosophy, you know, in the cradle, in the way that some of our younger philosophers are taught, is in the direction of turning into all argument and no vision. Um, I think that's right. But 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 it's worth noting in that kind of phrase of my old friend, which is quite nice, nice, is that there are two ways, I think, to kill philosophy. I mean, another way to kill it is all vision and no argument. Sure, yeah. Or, or to put it a little more broadly, since um, people can have, you know, overly narrow conceptions of what argument is, but all vision and no rigor and no method and, you know, no conception of, of you know, you know, an ordered and principled proceeding by which one makes progress and, that, and doesn't just sort of say, here's my vision, you know, um, that's kind of more what the bookstores call metaphysics, you know, or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it sort of starts to bleed into, you know, yoga, the occult or California something or who knows what. <laughs> um, um, so, I mean, philosophy needs to strike the right balance. Um, um, and, and I think sometimes there's kind of a, an overreaction of each of those forms of imbalance to the other. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, so um, you asked me, um, do I think I've made progress in philosophy? That, and where do you, where I think I'm going? That's how yeah. I heard those last two questions. So, um, so a retrospective and a prospective question <laughs> um, about the former. Um, yes. Yeah, I think I've made progress. Um, I mean, I, it would be hard to, um, um, you know, put in a nutshell a statement of what the progress is made. And, um, you know, Hillary Putnam says in another context, any philosophy that belongs, it can, any philosophy that can be put in a nutshell belongs in oh, one. A nutshell, yeah. perhaps, perhaps we could also add, you know, any form of philosophical progress that can be summed up and put in a nutshell belongs in one. Um, but, um, so, I mean, I don't think you could say something simple and short about that, but, um, but, you know, um, I look back at things I wrote earlier and, there are things I can value in them, but I can also see um, assumptions I don't share, um, narrowness of perspective, a certain kind of sharing of assumptions from some of my teachers or some of my, you know, I've picked out a number of people I respect very much, um, you know, in this list has included, you know, Kuhn and, um, and Putnam and McDowell and Stroud, and we could enrich that with names of other people like, um, um, Rawls, Cavell, Cordyme, and various other people. Um, but, um, but you know, one of the things I would say is, you know, part of what I would measure in my progress from each of those people is the way in which I've outgrown them in some way. You know, I also can look at them and see this is what I find dissatisfying now in Putnam. Or this is, you know, this is a certain kind of assumption Kuhn I see was actually debilitating or for all the things I like about him. So, so that's one way one makes progress in philosophy that's sort of palpable and measurable Yeah, is to see how one's outgrowing one teachers who at one point for them are the exemplifiers of God, I don't think I'll ever be able to come, you know, a thinker of that way. And then one feels at a certain point, like one is, you know, in a, a you know, a worthy conversation partner. And then another point, in trying to make progress with those problems, using that word advisedly, problems, <laughs> um, um, when one starts to see how certain forms of progress weren't possible, given certain ways that they viewed things that I now want to be able to flag as um, no longer obligatory ways of framing or shaping the problem. So that's, that's one way I can just measure my own progress um, against my teacher, but I can also see it in my own earlier writings. I can sort of see. Well, there's there's a lot of Putnam in this, so there's a lot of McDowell in this, and I share a lot of that, but I want to get rid of this bit now. Um, and then another way in which the progress is very palpable to me is especially when I have to discuss some earlier thing I've written. You know, people will invite me to talk about Wittgenstein, but they've read some very early articles of mine. And one thing I like to do is not be defensive. When somebody criticizes something of mine, not say, oh, oh dear, this is what's really right about it. I try to really enter into that defense, and there's off, uh, enter into the spirit of that criticism and there's usually something now that you know I can be detached <laughs> from that earlier point of view it's not being uttered in the first person present um, um, indicative where I was fully engaged I can also get some distance on it and so I can usually say well this 
Yeah, so those early things I wrote in the Tractatus, this is now what seems to me wrong or incomplete about this. And this is, I think, what I missed, and this is how I would put it. And by the way, um, this is what also seems to me just incomplete and hopeless in the whole Tractatus's conception, no matter how one defends it. And that's a different point. Um, not being generous one can to the book, but but not having the limits of one's generosity to the book be the limits of one's philosophy. Um, and so, um, and I noticed... I try to do those things and in noticing that I can do them and in taking um, the effort and time to do them, I, I can measure progress and usually am making some extra bit of progress and trying to measure the progress. If you see what I mean, yes. you know, in noticing that one really has no longer willing to say what one said before and being clear why you don't want to say it. You don't just describe the gain in philosophy. I think you consolidate it and you bring it to full consciousness. So there's an extra measure of progress in that. Um, so um, I think sometimes that makes some things I write seem a bit self-involved to people because you know I'm criticizing my earlier self. Um, um, but I, I find that is a way of sort of you know doing that sometimes is a way of making sure I am making progress. And um, this large book that came out recently called The Logical Alien, um, many hundreds of pages of which is by me is very much sort of an attempt to exhibit all of the ways in which I no longer agree with a, an early article of mine, which was quite, quite influential, which some people I like very much, liked very much. Um, but even where they criticize that article, my own view is now not to so much accept their criticism, but to disagree with something that both they and that early Jim Conant thought. And, and, and in doing that, I you know, I can measure my progress. So I think I think it is good as a philosopher, this is slightly going beyond your question, but I think it's not only good to be able to feel you've made progress, but I think it's an important thing in philosophy to have ways to develop instruments for measuring your progress. Because hmm. um, if you're not trying to do that, I don't know how what you really can know you are making progress. It's, you know, it's just like if you're trying to run the world's fastest mile, if you're never using a stopwatch and keeping track of your time, I don't think you really know whether you're getting fast, you know, and, and you're closing in on the Olympic record. And I think in a funny way, you know, if, if you want to be making progress in flights, you have to have ways of being able to confront your, your present self with your past self and see whether you can measure progress in what you're doing. And I have tried to do that in various ways. And in the light of that, I feel I can answer your question positively, even if I'm answering somewhat abstractly. Um, your prospective question, what's next for me in philosophy? Um, I feel like I'm not able to answer this question quite as clearly. Um, um, for reasons that I think have to do with my being reluctant to being able to. Um, um, I mean, if I could answer that question absolutely clearly, and I could say to you, Johnny, I think I've got N years left, and what I'm going to do is first this project, then that project, and this third project, and that's it. I have, in that very way of understanding my conception of my philosophical future, ruled out the possibility of any surprises. <laughs> um, and I feel like real progress always has to, you know, be open to the possibility of surprise. The ways in which I've made the most progress in, in the ways I would measure now be the ways in which um, my thought underwent forms of change that I could not have anticipated. And to me, that's, you know, um, I couldn't have even, if you described it, I wouldn't even know what you were talking about till after it happened. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have understood it. Um, and so, um, so I mean, I don't want to know exactly what's next for me um, because I think that means I'm going to stop making a certain kind of progress and I hope I will keep making progress. Um, you know, I have certain areas, certain, I have a lot of things I've been working on. I'd like to keep working on. It's always been the case in my life that I have too many of those and um, I move between them and I don't know which ones I'll finish and which ones I won't. So I, I have a book manuscript on philosophical skepticism. I have a book manuscript on the concept of America. I have a book manuscript on, um, uh, it's called, um, you know, um, uh, it's, it's on the ontology of the cinematic image. So it's on the philosophy of film or movies, but it, in ways that title might not um, make clear, connects up with a lot of my other interests that we've been talking about, but it also, broaches questions in aesthetics in a way that haven't come out in this interview. Um, I'm very interested 
still in philosophy of logic and logic. I'm thinking, I'm working on an article right now, which is called, you know, two traditions in history of logic, the math, um, what I call the logical mathematical tradition and the logical philosophical tradition. Borrowing that latter phrase from the title of the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Um, and, and two different ways of thinking about what logic is and, and how those two traditions have been related to each other and reacted off of each other. Um, so it's both an historical project, but also a project that's aimed at criticizing certain contemporary conceptions of logic. I have some interpretive essays on Wittgenstein that you know, are more or less written, which I'd like to finish up. I always do you know one of those every once in a while. Um, so um, there's, I've been thinking a lot about language um, and what, you know, the relation is between a language and the people they speak, who speak it, and how a language expresses um, a whole way of life, a form mm -hmm. of life, I guess I would say. And, I, is, I have a whole project there for which I've been collecting examples for some years and thinking hard about different languages and, you know, Yiddish and the people, the Jewish communities that spoke that as opposed to modern Greek, as opposed to Icelandic, as opposed to, um, you know, um, you know, Japanese, um, um, as opposed to um, certain pockets of English speakers. And I've been trying to collect certain kinds of examples of um, how, what is the ways in which certain languages are extremely articulate. There are more ways to sort of describe a type of person in Yiddish than any other language I know of. But when, you know, we have, you know, the average English speaker will just have a few words like fool or creep or asshole. Hmm. You know, Yiddish can draw incredibly <laughs> fine flavors of discrimination, you know, <laughs> you know, across a whole range of, of words, some of which are only slightly phonetically different from each other, which, which of course involve its pulling and drawing in more than one language to do that. You know, Hebrew, you know, German dialects, Russian, and so forth. Um, on the other hand, you know, you know, Yiddish is a language in which there was never any state, there was never any police, there was never any hierarchy. Um, nobody ever gave anybody, you know, no general or bureaucrat or such and such ever spoke in Yiddish to give anyone an order or a command. Or so there's, there's all kinds of ways in which the language is just unbelievably unarticulated, you know, respect to you know most other modern languages. And I think these things are funny kinds of functions each other, which are you know parts of like what that language is and what it expresses. And another aspect of that I'm very interested in is how the um, you know what I call the forms of sign are related to the forms of symbol, hmm. that the spoken version of the language the written version of the language, which predominates to what extent they mutually condition each other. Um, and because I think the tendency in analytic philosophy, a lot of it, you know, philosophy of language is so central in analytic philosophy. The way philosophers of analytic philosophers think about most things is through a certain picture of what language is. But the tendency of language is to think of it as just a bunch of words that have a bunch of meanings and then are combined by a bunch of rules. And then to think of signs as a bunch of marks or noises that are just interpreted. And so one of the things I want to do is sort of challenge the whole picture of the language that one has in analytic philosophy and sort of bring out, you know, the unity of the kind of organism language is and, and what it is to inhabit one. And I'd like to just ask you, I ask all my guests if they imagine themselves in Jezebel and this, and they could bring up a, a piece of music, a book and a luxury, what would they bring? Uh, so, uh, what would be your response to that? Yeah, well, I'm very bad at answering these questions. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I, I, I was doing a series of interviews with some Chinese philosophers, and um, they wanted to ask. They wanted to say, "What are your five favorite books?" Um, and I said, "I have no idea. I, I would. I would be very upset. Um, even choosing, I would. I, I, you know." feel like a mother who's being asked to choose between her children or something. I, I don't want to be able to answer that question. <laughs> it's not just, um, and, and then they kept trying to narrow it. And they said, well, how about five favorite philosophy books? And then how about, and then an interesting thing happened, which is because they really, these Chinese philosophers, they really want to ask this question, some question of this form. And so what wound up happening is, because I did a series of interviews with them, is we wound up having a negotiation in which what it turned into is, they were allowed to sort of define a category in some way. And then I was willing to choose my five favorite X's. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so if they wanted to choose, you know, you know, 
um, you know, modern Jewish literature or literature by Jews, you know, in any language. I would choose my five favorite books that brought out something about the nature of Jewish identity. If they wanted to choose my fav five favorite, you know, film noir, I would say something about my five favorite film noir. No, but I wasn't prepared to say something about my five favorite movies. And I just found then I could do that. And I could answer the question very well because I felt like I wasn't saying something about how film noir is the greatest kind of film and that and that it's greater than everything else and so forth. But, you know, I was... I was sort of exercising my um, discriminatory capacities in a way that didn't, didn't seem to me to involve, you know, insane judgments of preference. Um, I mean, otherwise, the only way I can construe the question is, you know, in terms of my psychic health or something, trying to survive these five years on the island, you know, what books did I bring? But that strikes me as like a totally different question, which isn't this yeah. big. So, well, I mean, I would ask this as a question was, like, what five books would you want to have with you on a desert island? And I realized, you know, if I took that question seriously, it wasn't anything like, what do I think the five greatest books of all time are? I, I realized that one book at that time I, I would be very tempted to take with me was David Thompson's Biographical Dictionary of Cinema. Um, oh, yeah. Not because it's one of, you know, I don't even know what genre that is, and it's probably the only instance of it. You know, I think it would be insane to say that's one of the five greatest books of that time, or probably even published in that year. Oh, I mean, there's a lot of editions of it. I, one thing I'd have to decide is which edition to take. But, uh, but, uh, but, um, but just, you know, it would be fun to read the entries. They would bring back home movies. You know, I actually disagree with what he says about certain directors or actors, but it's a fun thing to react to. I just think it might keep me sane on that desert island for a few years. It would, it would help kind of like bring a lot of stuff to mind and imagination. Yeah. You know, it would be a really good book to have in a desert island, I decided. But it's not at all the question I'm then answering isn't anything like um, – on the scale of value of you know great books or great movies, um, what are the five best? And then what's the greatest? I find one completely unanswerable. I think you have to not care about these things too much. I think to find uh, the question in that form answer, I don't mean to be sort of completely impugning the question, but I mean, if you really love movies, it's you're going to feel like there are different kinds of great movies. You're not just going to want to choose one. <laughs> um, so I find that question, you know. To be one, I just want to refuse on the point that it's answered. But um, but but also I'm happy to discuss things I really like if we can get the categories a little bit finer. So I feel like I'm exercising, you know, actual powers of discrimination and recommendation and bring out why this is a really great instance of kind X without sort of saying something crazy, you know, of the form this kind is better than all other kinds, you know. It's like that feels like. You know, I can say what colors I like, but I, I don't know how to say which colors are better than which numbers. And that's kind of what I feel like I'm doing, you know, when I just say what my favorite movie of all time is.